Andrew?
Good morning, everyone. If you could please take your seats. I know there's still a queue out um, for everyone coming in, so we'll just kind of give it a couple minutes, but let's, let's get ready so we can kick off this very exciting agenda. Right. Oh, welcome. Hello. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Gabby Terran. I'm an executive. I'm a member of the executive committee of the CBD's Global Partnerships for Business and Biodiversity. I'm also from the Endangered Wildlife Trust, a conservation NGO based in South Africa, uh, where I manage the National Biodiversity and Business Network. I'm also an elephant scientist, uh, having studied elephants for many, many years wandering around the bush and, and hiding in trees from, from elephants when they started following me. And I now work with some of the biggest businesses who are the biggest ecosystem engineers as well. So I just want to welcome you all to this Business and Biodiversity Forum. Please note that the morning sessions will be streamed live on YouTube. On the YouTube channel, participants can find the link in the schedule of COP15, and there's also interpretation available for English, French, and Chinese. Uh, speakers, when you come up, you're also welcome to remove your mask so we can all be human. I, I want to dedicate this, this Business and Biodiversity Forum where at this COP we've seen the biggest turnout of, of businesses ever, um, the most engagement. And I want to dedicate it to the, the African philosophy of Ubuntu. I am because we are. And I think this philosophy really shouts clear when we're talking about business. We're all, we're all connected. Every single one of us here depends on business. And every single business both depends on and impacts nature. In fact, the private sector is one of the biggest drivers of, of nature loss. Um, and I hope that this is an opportunity to collaborate to have the biggest opportunity to halt and reverse nature loss. And we can do it. In 2020, we did the unimaginable. We shut down borders. We all wore masks. We had meetings in our pajamas from our kitchens. Profitable businesses went from, from producing and, and selling gin to producing and profitably selling hand sanitizer. Sock makers went to producing masks. We changed entire value chains globally in a matter of days for the greater good, and we survived, and that is Ubuntu. We face an even bigger crisis with biodiversity loss. In fact, the World Economic Forum has it as one of the top three uh, risks to businesses globally. We're in a massive extinction event. We need to change, and we need to change now. We need to work together to implement an ambitious post-2020 global biodiversity framework. It's a big moment, and we can do it. We can sit down here with some of the world's biggest ecosystem engineers, the biggest drivers of habitat loss, of polluters of our water and our air, and we can, we can have uncomfortable conversations because we need to. We can change. Let's show you how. Let's give you tools. Let's have the conversations. Let's make a change, but we can't wait. We need to help each other to find common solutions. I am because we are. And with that spirit of Ubuntu and hope, I'd like to officially welcome you to the, the first Global Biodiversity Business and Forum kind of chat for the day. I'm gonna hand over to the facilitator of this high level opening session, Mr. Jorge Laguna Celes, who is head of the One Planet Network for the 10 year framework. Jorge. The floor is yours and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Gavi, for this 
absolutely wonderful welcome and for setting the stage. I am delighted to be here today with you, with all of you, business representatives, delegates, representatives of international organizations that have been working so hard, so committedly for the last over a week by now. I can't even imagine the effort that you are putting in this process, that you have been engaging and feeding our negotiators with ideas in the context of the Place Quebec, the side events, the interactive discussions and the informal consultations. You are working for a very strong post-2022 global biodiversity framework. I am absolutely delighted, privileged to really accompany as representative of the One Planet Network, a network that is all about solutions to implement Sustainable Development Call 12. Why? Because SDG 12 is the common thread that it's connecting the triple planetary crisis. Our patterns of unsustainable consumption and production are impacting the business models, the aspirational consumptions that are driving uh, the damaging and our ecosystems, and as well, the need to transform and disrupt from within. So we are absolutely delighted, we're privileged to be part of this effort and to accompany the Business and Biodiversity Forum. This is not the first time this happens, as a matter of fact, it is testament of the commitment of the business community, your commitment in investing in this process. Why? You understand that it is a central process to define a new compact for nature. It will provide inputs to your strategies. It will help you disrupt from within. I have a wonderful panel to introduce today, and I would like to call a group of leaders that have accepted to invest time with us in a what I hope and with your support we will make it that interactive discussion. I will call them in order and invite you, please ask you to give them a very warm round of applause. I will start with our dear friend Diane Holdorf, who is the Vice President of the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Welcome Diane and thank you so much for the great work your organization is doing. Please join me in the stage. Another great friend of the One Planet Network, working with us in the Sustainable Tourism Program, Julia Simpson, who is the CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council. Julia, welcome. Please join us to the stage. Let's give her a warm round of applause. I'll also call on Joe Tyndall, who is the director at the Environment Directorate at the OECD, helping develop policies that will make us more ambitious and act for nature. Julia, welcome. Welcome to the stage. I'll also call upon Mr. Shang Yu Yong, Director General of Environmental Cooperation Center at the Ministry of Ecology and Environment of China. Welcome. And of course, last but not least, and I really ask you to reserve your warmest round of applause to Ms. Elizabeth Maruma Merema, who is the Executive Secretary of the CBD and the driving engine behind this process. Welcome, Elizabeth. And now I get the chance to also see it in the wonderful company of this panel to make this as interactive as possible. So just let me make sure that my microphone is working. Excellent, excellent. It always changes when one sits down and gets in this company and tries to make it a bit more, uh, more engaging, more interactive. And as a matter of fact, uh, the rules of the game that I propose for today is that we work around three blocks of issues. And we have a bit over an hour to have a very strong and interactive discussion. The first one, it's and, and, and these blocks of issues, I borrow them from the uh, business for Nature, excellent work that has been doing with many of you have been involved in a call for action, a manifesto that we hope emerges from this business and biodiversity forum. And there are three key words that have struck me particularly. First one is A, assessment, assessing. 
second one committing and third one transforming and we will hear beautiful stories we will hear examples but we will also try to be succinct in order to hear from the audience and then be able to react and see what strong messages we can send to the process so that we can all celebrate a week from now a transformative agenda my first speaker for today uh, that I have the, the the real the real pleasure to I already welcome, but I don't think I've I've I've, I've said enough good things about her is Diane Holdorf, who is uh, currently the executive vice president at the World Business Council of Sustainable Development. The WBCSD needs absolutely no introduction, but there's something that it really struck me as I was reading uh, Diane's uh, bio. It is that you have superpowers. And that is, that is so exactly what we need to transform, to disrupt, to look for uh, a, a, a transformative strategies and helping businesses adopt them. In 2022, you were selected, and this is very important, it's not my invention, I'm quoting really, one of the 25 badass women shaping climate action by Green Business. Is that correct? <laughs> Let's give her a hand. We need more of those, we need more leaders. But also, but also, she was recognized as a maize and wheat superwoman by the wonderful institution CIMIT. And that is because of your great work that you did as Chief Sustainability Officer at Kellogg in transforming value chains. And so I'm really privileged, honored to welcome you today. And uh, the question and the first element that I wanted to, to, to put on the agenda, it is a recent report that the CDP, for those of you that don't know it, it's a not-for-profit charity that runs a global disclosure system. It's just launched at the eve of this conference a report that sent, uh, you know, chills down my spine, right? This report indicated that despite progress in the number of companies choosing to be transparent, to assess, to disclose, and to include biodiversity in their reporting, the majority are not actually turning commitments into action. So... Uh, is the strategy versus culture, what are those factors that are hampering this progress? So my question for you, Diane, is uh, why don't you start and set up the scene with telling us how to ensure that these strategies that businesses are developing move from big announcements, which we welcome and we want to hear today those big announcements, to actual concrete actions. What are the challenges in this regard from your perspective, please? All right, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. First, Elizabeth, thank you for the leadership that you've continued to show and to China for the tremendous patience to make sure that we get to this very important point here last week and this week. We're all really looking forward to a highly ambitious outcome at the end of this week, and I know that it's been a big push to get here. I'd also like to acknowledge quickly and extremely importantly that we're gathering today on the unceded territories of the Mohawk, whose beautiful lands extend all the way down into upstate New York, where I grew up in the Mohawk Valley. And this location here in particular is one where the historic reverence of leaders of multiple nations coming together to gather is so still relevant for us. And we need to keep that arc of justice present in our all of our conversations. And that carries through into how we as leading businesses have to show up as well. It's both inherent in what we seek for the governments to do this week, setting out that ambitious framework. And then Jorge, as you said, how do we come in as the economic sector behind that? The science is really clear. The economic analysis on action for nature is really clear. The good news in the CDB report, Jorge, that you referenced is that companies are already paying attention to this challenge. However, we can't just stop there. As you said, we have learned that lesson on climate. We know what action looks like. We know what the accountability frameworks are. And today with the monitoring and evaluation discussion so present, that's a particularly important topic for us to be very, very focused on. We have to really recognize though that important in setting up those accountability frameworks is the ability to have clear targets, clear metrics, and the translation of those into actions. That work is underway. And those actions then need to be translated into ways that capital markets can recognize and place value on performance through clear governance, transclosure, and reporting mechanisms from a business perspective, not just from 
uh, global biodiversity framework mechanism perspective, although it's critical that they're linked. And you're right, I mean, business really does rely on natural assets. Every single economic sector is extremely dependent. That ability, however, to acknowledge that is one that companies haven't been close to. And, you know, we had this great report put out recently by WWF and Bain, and I think Jenny from Bain is here in the audience. It shows that this is not a well understood topic yet in business. The number of companies that are here, though, shows me that readiness to understand what needs to happen and the actions that we need to take. It's really, frankly, unprecedented, particularly just two or three weeks after the climate COP to have almost the same level of engagement. And yes, there's challenges on both sides, Article 15 and make it mandatory. Hashtag make it mandatory is really important. There are some who push against it, but it's really important to acknowledge the leading business voices like ours and the members that we represent and those here on the panel that it is relevant, important, and desired. And that's what we need to focus on. So we're really pleased to have been working with so many of the great partners that are here, including 60 of our members who've been deeply involved in creating the roadmap, the guidance for the actions so that it's clear that we can drive both an accelerated plan, but also a consistent, incredible action plan across all businesses. And we've gone particularly deep in three sectors that are the highest impact sectors, the land use sector, both forests and agriculture, the built environment sector, and the energy system sector to understand what is it that we actually need to take. And it waits for the recognition that the science is not fully there yet, but acknowledges that we can move forward with proxy metrics. What are the KPIs that we can still measure while waiting for the important work of the science-based target network to do that conversion? And it shows that piloting the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure is an inherently important part of what that accountability framework needs to look like. So just like the governments are putting together the monitoring and, and uh, M&E plans, businesses as well, and we're driving that integral part of how we build it into the roadmap for nature positive action by business. A lot of work still to do, but these types of guidance and these types of very specific coherent actions and frameworks are what give me real hope, Jorge, that we can move very quickly on this topic. Thank you, thank you very much. And, um, and building on, on the point that you raised about high impact sectors, indeed, Science tells us, and we know we have to invest in these three sectors that are driving uh, the the, the uh, unsustainable patterns of consumption and production. But there is one in particular that is not of the top three, that not only uh, I think it is seminal in the sense that because of its operations, and I'm talking about tourism, because of its aspirational nature, because of how it's connected to localities, how it's connected to people, how it's connected to communities, nature and land, because many of the tourists travel to see and experience nature, can show the way, can show the way. And, and, and I'd like to invite Julia, who is uh, Julia Simpson. I, I, of course, I've already introduced her. You know, uh, she's the president and CEO of the World Travel Tourism Council. But uh, before joining the World Travel and Tourism Council, Julia spent um, 14 years in one of the uh, high impact sectors that you just mentioned, transportation in the aviation sector on the board of British Airways, Iberia, the chief of staff at International Airlines Group, major conglomerate. So I think that Julia, you are uniquely positioned to tell us about how uh, the tourism industry is adapting to put biodiversity at the heart of what drives the tourism industry, but also how unsustainable tourism contributes to biodiversity loss. How have you, from the perspective of the World Tourism and Travel Council, applied principles of circular economy to sustainable tourism? And what are the top three actions the industry can take to halt or reverse biodiversity loss by the end of 2030? Julia. Uh, Jorge, thank you so much for that generous introduction and thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, I'd also like to begin just by saluting the courage and leadership of Elizabeth, um, who is doing an amazing job. And if there's one critical ingredient we're going to need, ingredient, it is that kind of courage in leadership. So thank you very much. And also, I would like to thank uh, the Chinese and Xiao Te here today um, for um, hosting this, but in Canada, and therefore thanking Canada um, for doing this. So a lot of thank you and to my fellow panelists. Um, it's 
absolutely right that uh, travel and tourism is intricately bound with nature. Um, our business, which is a $9.6 trillion business, I would say 50% of every trip that is made involves some sort of engagement with nature. And I think the, the trick here and the opportunity is to turn destinations and also travelers into guardians of nature. And that is where we need to get to because it can be a powerful force for good, but as you quite rightly say, Jorge, it can sometimes have a history of damaging nature as well, which we really, really need to tackle. Um, I wanted to just talk first of all about the highly critical link between greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity. And I know we're here to talk about biodiversity, so I don't want to you know, move to the other side. But just very, very quickly, the World Travel and Tourism Council, we represent 200 of the top CEOs globally um, for this massive business that is travel and tourism. And we represent every aspect, airlines, airports, hotels, tour operators, cruise liners. So we, we are the voice of the industry. And I wanted really to thank the UNWTO because it's because of the UNWTO and because they open their arms to our business that we are here today. And I really want to hopefully that we, you know, we can help. But the point about um, greenhouse gas emissions is we have just published, and please go onto our website, it's the most fantastic, literally first time ever, ability to count exactly our um, greenhouse gas emissions in travel and tourism. They represent globally 8.1%, and we've measured everything absolutely everything, supply chains, value chains, direct, indirect, induced of the whole whole lot. So it's the first time it's been measured and it now means you can't manage what you can't count, okay? It's an old maxim. Um, but it now means that we can look at this year by year. We've got a baseline of 2010 and a baseline of 2019. And we can also cut it by 185 countries. And we can also look at water, waste, energy, so we can slice it horizontally. So it's a little bit of a plug for that, but it is our gift. I have to say Saudi Arabia has financed this for us, which is showing their commitment uh, to this. But please, please use that data because it is so critically linked to the two. And the two actions from there that are critical for my sector, where we need government help, is sustainable aviation fuels. Um, it is the only quick way to meet the Paris agreements that we are going to get somewhere, but we need government's help. We need oil producers to start making more SAF. Currently, they see it as a little bit of a sideshow. It's critical. We need that. And we need governments to set the enabling environments in terms of incentives to do that. The other thing is energy creation. In Europe, we're suffering now an energy crisis and there's a big drive on renewables. But when a traveler goes into a hotel or here today and we turn on the light, we're not in control of where that electricity and energy has come from. So we need it to come from, from renewables. Uh, but just going to biodiversity and trying to talk about the win-win, we have got some great examples already and I'd like to focus on some of the positives. Um, Iberostar, one of our members, is doing some great adaptation work around mangroves in Punta Cana in the Dominican Republic, which was a very quickly developed Caribbean island. It's please look at that work. Mangroves are so critical to us. We need to save every mangrove we've got. So very, very important work. In Rwanda, we all know about the gorillas. But the issue about the gorillas is the money it makes gets plowed back into the local communities and into more um, sustainable, nature positive um, projects. So it's where tourism, as we all know, a, a, an alive whale is of more value to, to tourism and to the planet than a dead whale is to fisher folk. I, we're not allowed to say fishermen anymore, but you know what I mean. So it's a, it's a really, really important message. And finally, a country that you might not always think about, but Saudi Arabia is investing $800 billion in pivoting its economy away from oil and gas and pivoting it around travel and tourism. They are building some incredible projects. If you look at Alula on its own, it's the size of Belgium. They are rewilding with one 
billion trees and they are reintroducing the Arabian leopard. So they are using travel and tourism as a source for good. And, you know, I do credit um, His Excellency Al-Khatib in this. Again, another man like Elizabeth with a great deal of courage. In terms of my three points, my three things, what I would like to talk about is very much really recognizing what you were saying is we... A lot of my members are saying to us, we've just uh, published a nature positive f uh, framework for all of our members to look at. But what they're saying to us is, how do we do it at the local level? What should we prioritize? Are we prioritizing the elephants or the black rhino or you know, getting rid of the lionfish? You know, what, what do we should we be prioritizing? So we need to work with destinations, local government to have clear plans, clear frameworks with targets that are transparent and are locally shared. So that would be my first thing. But please look at our framework as it, it, it starts that path. Um, and my second thing is, our members, I want to let you know, they really believe in this issue. They really are grasping it. Uh, we have had a sustainability committee now for many, many years. And I cannot begin to tell you, a bit like your former corporate life, how committed these people to are to it. Actually, in British Airways, we had environmental reports in the 1970s. So it's not that there's a lack of willpower here, but I am very proud to be here to get it onto the agenda. I think my final point is we can't do it alone. We really, really need the support of governments and destinations to help us. Thank you. Thank you for setting the scene, Julia, for those wise remarks. Indeed, um, I can say that many of the companies that you mentioned, they are part of uh, what we call uh, on, on carbon neutrality, the um, Glasgow Declaration that together with UNWTO and over 100 uh, 800 uh, enterprises and counting, we are setting a vision as One Planet Network for a carbon neutral uh, tourism that cuts by 50% their emissions, but on plastics, the global tourism plastic initiatives. And let's not forget the role of small and medium enterprises of accountability measures and support for these companies so that no one is left behind. Next on, 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 on this wonderful panel, um, uh, I am uh, pleased to um, welcome uh, Joe, Joe Tyndall, who is uh, the director of the Environment Directorate from the, of the OECD recently, since September 2022. Welcome. Welcome, Joe. Perhaps this is, well, of course, this is your first CVD conference in this role, I have no doubt, but you are very much familiar with the issues because um, previously, Joe was New Zealand's High Commissioner ambassador to Singapore, and also she served as New Zealand's climate change ambassador. You also have a very, very strong experience in communicating, in explaining people through your previous experiences, director of broadcasting unit, Ministry of Culture and Heritage. So you're uniquely positioned, as a matter of fact, to share with us how countries are being called out in the negotiation process to work on reforming government support, including very important issue for these discussions today, subsidies that are harmful to biodiversity. Well, we would like to hear from you, and I think everybody here is it's interesting hearing is your take on why is phasing out and eliminating harmful subsidies critical? As the Secretary General mentioned, the UN Secretary General, when he opened the conferences, many of the rules that we're setting for the game are actually driving us and putting us at war with nature. So how can we use the power of public procurement, the power of taxes, the power of incentives to ensure that we shift that trend? Why is phasing out and eliminating harmful subsidies critical? How can we make progress in this regard? Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Jorge. And it, um, it really is uh, an honor and a privilege to, to be here. As you said, my first CBD COP, uh, but a veteran of many, many climate change COPs. Um, and uh, I'm so pleased to have been asked uh, this question because uh, the issue of environmentally harmful subsidies is, is very dear to my heart. Um, we know that governments provide uh, subsidies and other forms of support uh, like market price uh, uh, support, so it's not a really a direct transfer, um, but they do that in pursuit of uh, a whole range of objectives and often with the very best of intentions. But a lot of these subsidies can inadvertently cause serious harm to biodiversity. Just to give you a little bit of uh, um, statistical background, uh, the OECD data show that more than half 
of government support to agriculture. That's equivalent to around 390 billion US dollars per year is potentially environmentally harmful. Other big areas are fishery and industry policies that also have environmentally harmful consequences. And um, after a couple of years where the numbers were looking as though they were trending in the right direction in terms of fossil fuel subsidies, back around 2016, it wasn't looking so bad, still bad enough, at about 450 billion, um, it's shot back up. Uh, and uh, we've calculated, uh, along with the International Energy Agency, that uh, uh, fossil fuel support totaled 732 billion US dollars in 2021. So these incentives are absolutely in total conflict with biodiversity goals and objective, uh, objectives. They also tend to be market distorting, so they encourage wasteful consumption, for example, and completely inefficient. Especially where they're not targeted, they end up sort of lining the pockets of those who need them the least. So reforming uh, or eliminating harmful incentives, including subsidies, is hardly a new idea. It's been around for many, many years in many forums and in biodiversity there have been multiple calls uh, for over a decade now, including in uh, HA target, uh, HE Target 3, which calls for eliminating or reforming sub subsidies harmful to biodiversity by 2020. Well, some progress was made uh, by some countries, but uh, it's pretty clear, clear there's still a lot more to do. So why is it critical? If you don't phase out these environmentally harmful subsidies, governments are sending totally inconsistent and contradictory signals to business and to others, in fact. Biodiversity loss will be accelerated and uh, the, uh, the value of biodiverse nature to life, to livelihoods, and to uh, uh, the health of the planet will simply not be understood until it's too late. And then you asked how. Okay, so how to phase it out. Um, and I want to pick up on the, the, uh, the adage, you can't manage what you don't measure. It's absolutely correct. So a critical first step is for governments to do a bit of domestic homework, to identify and assess the subsidies they are, um, and other forms of uh, um, incentives they are, are, are providing, and uh, consider the harm they are causing. Uh, those such as assessments were called for under the CBD, only a few governments have done so, and clearly some help is needed. Um, I'm going to do a bit of shameless promotion uh, for the OECD now here, uh, just uh, by announcing that we uh, have released very recently a new report uh, called Identifying and Assessing Subsidies and Other Incentives Harmful to Biodiversity. Not a particularly catchy title, but well worth a read because the report compares and analyzes national assessments and provides really good practice insights that we hope other countries can then pick up on and uh, uh, make use of. When it comes to implementing subsidy reform, we've identified some success factors. And just to touch on those very quickly, it includes ensuring strong stakeholder engagement through consultation and communication. We've seen many instances where governments have, you know, unilaterally and suddenly, abruptly, taken subsidies away and faced literally riots on the streets. So you've got to do the right uh, preparatory work with uh, stakeholder engagement. You've got to identify the winners and losers of possible reforms, and then you have to identify and devise targeted policy packages to address the distributional impacts um, that will kind of have the impact on the, the winners and losers. So just to conclude, let me say that by eliminating environmentally harmful subsidies, governments no longer incentivize nature's destruction. But we're still left, even if they do that, with a massive market failure. Biodiversity and the ecosystem services it provides would still remain largely unpriced and therefore underprovided. 
The best analogy I can come up with is, is kind of, um, if you get rid of the subsidies, it's like getting out of bi a biodiversity debt by bringing the bank balance back to zero, but that's not good enough. You need a credit balance in your bank account to be nature positive. So uh, to reflect the true value of nature in, in uh, economic and business decision making, uh, I think echoing other speakers, governments are going to have to scale up and increase the ambition of incentives that promote and support biodiversity. Things like taxes on pollution and resource use, uh, tradable permits for fishing and water use, and biodiversity positive subsidies. They need uh, the need to put in place uh, positive incentives that protect biodiversity was firmly embedded in HE Target 3, uh, and uh, the need has, if anything, increased. So scaling up uh, biodiversity positive incentives has got to be a core component of Target 18. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jo. Uh, let's give her a hand, please. Absolutely. We need that level of clarity, and we absolutely need that level of unequivocal and unambiguous uh, message about the need to reduce, eliminate uh, harmful subsidies for biodiversity and the environment. That is absolutely critical. Uh, in One Planet Network, I like to call it uh, the power of the public purse. Uh, and it is indeed, and, and Joe mentioned it, uh, there is a number of tools, subsidies, of course, but also incentives procurement exercises, and then nudging exercises to change consumption. I really want us to hear stories about that. And linking very much to what Joe was mentioning, the power of states to shift, transform industries, support those that are getting left behind, assessing and understanding their impacts. I have the real pleasure and privilege to welcome Mr. Kui Shu uh, Hong who is a director general, I already mentioned, on uh, the Natural Ecology Protection Department at the Ministry of Ecology and Environment of the People's Republics of China. Originally, at the beginning of your career, you were a researcher and a scientist, so you bring that uh, science background, but you've combined that with a strong, strong policy aspects. And I really want to mention a specific achievement in which you have been instrumental and for me, it really shows the, uh, the leadership of China in this regard. And I was very pleased, and I'm sure that everyone here is pleased, you have seen it in the news, that just last year, 2021, the uh, government of China removed the great panda from the endangered, uh, well, highly endangered species. And now it's, of course, it's still, it's still, it's, protected it's still uh but it's no longer uh facing uh critical extinction and that that it was very much part of your team effort but you have been instrumental to it so i want to recognize that and give you a, a round of applause for the wonderful wonderful work and um also in your role you are helping the chinese government working to create an enabling environment what joe was speaking about at the national level to ramp up action from businesses. What can you share with us? Thank you for the host. Um, because, yeah, I would like to talk to everyone in Chinese, if that's all right. OK, once again, I. I have to thank you for the invitation, and I'm going to de deliver my speech in Chinese. And it's my it's my honor uh, for for your introduction in terms of our protection policy we have achieved in China, on um, including removing a panda from the list of endangered species. And uh, you can once again um, see the ambition we have in China in terms of protecting uh, biodiversity, and it's my pleasure to 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 be joining in the meeting here, where I can share with my opinion with each one uh, in terms of post-2020 global biodiversity framework and also the pathway and the action we are taking. And first of all, 
uh, on behalf of People's Republic of China, uh, Ministry of Ecology and Environment, uh, I would like to show my most uh, gratitude to the event. In terms of the, the in terms of the statement, uh, the, host, the the gentleman just mentioned before, in terms of the governmental level, and based on our policy, I would share some idea from myself with you. So, Chinese government pays a lot of attention on protecting biodiversity, uh, in cooperating with the other enti enterprises uh, in China. First of all, we focus on the policy uh, guidance. So basically, uh, we gather all the opinions in terms of protecting um, biodiversity. During the CPP 20th Communist Party, where we focus on the fact that we have to pay more attention on restoration and conversation of environment in China with the guidance of the cooperation between uh, the central policy and also the companies, a uh, private sector. Uh, secondly, we have to promote um, uh, promote uh, propagation of the, the awareness of environmental protection by, by coming up with more meeting and also more policy and regulations. Uh, in June 2021, uh, from our ministry, we, again, as you say, we hold a really uh, important meeting in Kunming, um, which was very highly welcomed by all the private sector globally and also domestically in China. And also uh, from Mount Real and Kunming, in terms of the COP15, we've made a lot of commitment. Thirdly, uh, Chinese government has promoted and formulated a really comprehensive policy. Um, starting in 2017, uh, we have implemented the framework uh, yeah, the business diversity framework. In May this year, uh, during the, the meeting, we also establish we also establish an alliance of protecting China business biodiversity uh, partnership uh, with the focus on promoting uh, the private sector and cooperating with the public sector together to come up with some policies and solutions. Uh, in, in China, uh, so the lines in the partnership, which I just mentioned before, has been established in May. And now, during the past seven months, the, the partnership has already gathered more than 50 private sectors to join it. Uh, Two days ago, uh, CPBT in China, we also held a meeting back in China uh, where we meet all the private sector from China to see how can we form a better uh, communication and cooperation in terms of bio biodiversity. So in China, as you can see, we are focusing a lot more and put more, more effort in terms of protecting uh, bio diversity and also to combat the climate change as well as deal with the problem caused by solution and to further comprehensively and put more effort to another level that's my brief introduction thank you thank you very much dr yu yun for that comprehensive uh, overview of uh, good positive actions and how they are accelerating uh, with the support of the Chinese government. The last, uh, the last uh, intervention, and then we will go, as I mentioned, we want to hear from you across the blocks of issues that we have been discussing. 
Um, it's, of course, from Elizabeth Marema, uh, who needs no introduction, but I will still mention that Elizabeth comes from a very strong, not only scientific background, but thus knows the work of the conventions and the treaties. She was uh, uh, the director of uh, the Law Division in UNEP, but also the executive secretary of UNEP's Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species, so important, and uh, also acting executive secretary of ASCOVANS and interim secretary of the UNEP Guerrilla Agreement. All of these institutions, as you know, are based in Bonn, Germany. I personally know Elizabeth, she's a good friend of mine, and she knows my passion for Tanzania and Kiswahili, so I'm going to try just a little bit uh, to either embarrass myself, but no, because it's the most beautiful language. Mpuenda Elizabeth Asante Kwakasi Yako Nusuri. Basically, that means congratulations and thank you for the great work you're doing. So thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth governments, and we have here it, we have been trying, but we have been sometimes moving fast, but not fast enough, right? That's the issue. Uh, in mainstreaming biodiversity into policies and moving to the idea of whole of government. The same can be said, and it's, it's frank, about businesses. Despite being more successful in advancing the biodiversity agenda, concrete action, but progress has been and continues to be slow, we need it to be faster. And oftentimes, companies choose to develop strategies that are restricted to a particular brand or line or products, but don't cover the entire portfolio. And this would be interesting to see how we can inform consumers and how can we use those strategies to really disrupt, as I have mentioned. From your perspective, what are the risks if, this continue, if we continue in this path? And uh, I mean, uh, business as usual, and what are the opportunities that we're seeing now uh, to build a new deal for nature and shift trajectories? This is what we're expecting out of this conference. Thank you very much, uh, Laguna. And a sincere thanks also to all my panelists here and for the participants here. Important question has been raised. And I think I will take a step back. Indeed, business as usual is no longer an option. Business as usual is what has brought us to where we are, where the recent scientific reports are giving us all the gloomy numbers, gloomy pictures. But also, I will say, we have all, and I'm sure the business have learned the lessons of the past. And one key example is for many years, the big, and no, it's not just the business. Many of us, our work has fo had focused on silo mandates, silo focus. While we know now very well that biodiversity nature is a cross-cutting issue and cannot be dealt with in silos. For many years, also, the business, just as governments, had focused his attention on climate actions. And tools, metrics on climate have been developed. But delighted that now, again, reports have clearly proven that we cannot deal with climate without nature. Climate and nature are directly connected, and solutions to climate can are equally solutions to biodiversity and vice versa. And these issues need to be looked at in an integrated fashion. The fact that the business had done already a lot on climate, this is that increasing understanding and awareness that one issue can not be dealt without the other. And now we also know Biodiversity will provide and is providing solutions to climate mitigation and adaptation, and therefore solutions need to be looked at together. Having said this, then what we want to see the business doing, we know some have done, but that needs to be scaled up and more needs to come on board, is actually looking at a whole of society approach, mainstreaming biodiversity nature into the business strategies. And we know also businesses, some have done, 
are doing, some are new yet to do, and therefore, as businesses are looking at that mainstreaming climate and, be, uh, and nature or biodiversity, is also to empower those new ones which are, ready, are yet to catch up. So questions of capacity development within the business, within the biz development of business strategies, tools, and metrics then becomes important because not all are at the same level, even at that business uh, operations. And those new ones coming up, those who have not done, need also to catch up. A lot of tools, metrics are already available. And there was a study which had been done by NGOs which had told us over 3,000 tool data are available out there, but they are scattered all over the place to the extent that they may not become then useful if businesses have to begin figuring out which data is correct, which one is appropriate to use, and at what uh, point of the operations. But we are also seeing uh, institutions actually bringing these data metrics, scenarios in a, in a more holistic uh, approach for, to make them user friendly. We are also now seeing with the negotiations going on, there, is, there are specific draft targets or targets being negotiated, which are targeting specifically at business. And delighted also, what we are seeing, at particularly this time, unlike the past, is the engagement of the business even in these negotiations, in the development of the, uh, of the, uh, the framework. We have seen, for instance, Business for Nature leading uh, the mandatory uh, call or mandatory reporting requirement, draft target uh, 15, which will already call on business and financial institutions to not only assess their impacts and dependencies on nature, but to be able also to report and disclose those impacts and risks. And of course, an enabling environment for business to operate by governments will be key. But I think it's also encouraging to see the pressure from the governments, sorry, from the business, actually calling governments to make it mandatory. We see this campaign of over 330 businesses, national institutions, which have already signed to that, really pushing governments to make it mandatory. We know some governments have already required those mandatory disclosure. France, UK have done, are already doing so. Others are coming on board, but it's really encouraging to see not the government pressurizing uh, business, but this time is the other way around. Government, I mean, business putting pressure on governments. This is completely a new development and completely changing the narrative of how we look at business. And it also equally underlines the fact that when the framework is adopted, it's not the framework for government, it's a framework for us all. No one should be left behind, including us at individual. And delighted that now the business has seen that for their operations to continue and be profitable, it cannot be business as usual. It cannot be uh, uh, just expansion less of agricultural land, which uh, scientists are alleging may have been one of the reasons which has led us to a lockdown uh, for two years or more. So business operations need to change. Uh, value chains, food systems, also our choices. And Jorge will have talked of sustainable consumption and production. What is our choice? Because our individual choices will also change the markets and will also change the production. So we can see it's not just the business, but the business operates on the demands. And who then put those demands is their choices also made by the citizen. 
So mainstreaming of biodiversity into business operations, into the decision making of the businesses become key. And the previous panelist has spoke, had spoken about subsidies and the framework is already looking at if only, and we know that's a drop in the ocean, but only half a billion, $500,000 uh, of harmful subsidies are redirected, repurposed to uh, biodiversity positive activities that will already contribute into reducing the financial gap being looked at for uh, implementation of the framework. The framework is looking at at least $700 billion by 2030. So imagine if half a billion of that, uh, of harmful subsidies is uh, repurposed to positive subsidies, the gap will be reduced by 200 billion. That is not a small number. And we know also, if we just look at fossil fuel production, $2.6 trillion are spent per year on fossil fuel. Half of that to biodiversity. The discussions going on by negotiators on the means of implementation, raising resources for implementation. The issue is not that resources are not available. Funds are available but they are available and spent into harmful activities. Let us change that narrative and spend those resources into positive ones. Thank you. Asante Sana, Elizabeth, thank you very much. Now we have, actually, we have a half an hour for what I hope can be a very interactive discussion building on this absolutely important insights that we have heard from all the panelists here. I, for one, I am a supporter of the High Level Business Action for Nature call, which has been coordinated and many of the organizations, many of you have been part of it. You've calling for assessing, make it mandatory. We passed already uh, 10 years of calling for disclosure uh, and we cannot backtrack. Committing, let's make commitments, but then let's transform, right? So. Uh, I propose if you, uh, we have uh, for two minutes short interventions uh, that you want to make a question to the panelists or to share a particular insight around these three blocks, a message that you want be captured in the outcome of the forum. Please raise your hand. Uh, we have microphones here in the room and I see two here and to there, the more voices we want to hear, so be succinct. Let's start with the two wonderful hands here, and then we'll go to two wonderful hands on the other side of the room. Introduce yourself, and uh, you have one uh, and a half minutes to uh, make your point. Remember, assess, commit, transform. Over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, Candace Stevens, I chair Africa's Sustainable Finance Coalition. My question is for Joe. Uh, you mentioned creating a, a credit, a positive bank account when it comes to subsidies and incentives. We've seen very few countries create positive uh, fiscal incentives to address nature conservation. Um, I'd love to hear your insights on, on that, not just addressing harmful subsidies, but actually developing and innovating new uh, tax incentives. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And also for setting the example. There was another, another hand there next to you. Sir? Yes, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Sean Nazar Ali. I come from uh, Mozambique. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, this issue of mandatory disclosure is all very well, and it's good, and it looks like it probably will be placed in the convention. However, to become really mandatory, it's going to need to be incorporated into national legislation. Can the CBD take a leading role in defining methodologies for that to be done? The thousands of methodologies are incredibly complex. Countries like mine do not have the ability to sort through all these different frameworks and come up with anything that's, that looks reasonable and appropriate. So we really need the CBD, I think, to take a leading role in defining appropriate methodologies. We have eight years. It's going to take us two years just to organize our, our NBSAPs in accordance with the new framework. Mm. 
this legislation will take too long unless we get good guidance. Thanks. Thank you. Translating commitments into national action. Those two brave hands there. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Tony Simons. I'm representing Estenor Ventures here. Um, three, three quick things. The first one is um, business wants clear signals, whether that's an investor, a corporate or SMEs. What clear signals are coming out of this meeting? Secondly, um, businesses are wanting ways to look at clearer synergies and to realign their business model, but also to understand and identify trade-offs and antagonisms because it's not always win, win, win. And thirdly, businesses are wanting to better to compete, to innovate, and how are they gonna go down that path and, and compete with others, but in that positive way, rather than some of the uh, past destructive ways. Thank you, those are very, very good points. Uh, let, I propose we take uh, two additional points, maybe here in the middle of, there was another hand there, yes, sir, and madam, and one more hand here, um, over there in the back. we we'll start with you, sir. Uh, thank you, Andrew Peterson, the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia. My question pivots from the last question, which is, what does the panel see as the role of private sector finance uh, as a result of the GBF being uh, implemented? Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Madam, please introduce yourself. Yes. Um, a microphone here. Hello, can you hear me? Sorry. So I'm Inas from Yemen. Uh, I'm a communication officer at UNOS, and also I'm uh, presenting Youth Council back in my country today. Um, thank you so much for this discussion. Very interesting. One comment uh, from my side, what I have noticed that everyone, uh, regardless of their speciality, they were focusing on communication on the different uh, stages um, uh, to achieve uh, this main objective. Um, I do believe, uh, I'm not sure, quite not sure if this is available, but I do believe that there should be a communication hub where um, all the uh, guidance, uh, reports, and even people uh, the uh, the representative of the different uh, businesses um, identifying them and their rules. Uh, um, having this unified communication hub would be very useful for businesses who are uh, going towards this target and also for people uh, who are interested, media and so on, whoever wants to know mm. the results so far. Thank you. Thank you for, for that idea. Not all the businesses have the ability to invest in coming here. They're mostly small and medium enterprises. How do we translate these commitments into strategies? Let's take, if there is one last, and then I'll go to the panel. Yes, I saw, see a brave hand there in the back. Yes, sir, yeah. Hello. Is that coming? Yep. yep. Great. Hello, uh, my name's Matt Sykes. I'm the Chief Regen Officer at Regeneration Projects, and my question relates to the purpose of business. We seem to be in a conversation that's focused very much on an older generation of business, but as you just touched on, there are many younger uh, generations of businesses, many of them small, that are coming through. One of the First Nations elders that we work with in Australia, a lady called Japari Moningirić, she talks about the way that fire uh, promotes regeneration in a landscape, and instead of looking at the older trees as they're regrowing, emphasizes the importance of looking at the regeneration coming through in the new shoots from the seed bank. We've just finished a research process with the Victorian government's Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions, and it's very clear from that research that younger and older generations are not interested in sustainability anymore. 
they're interested in regeneration. One in three young people in the group that was surveyed walk into work and the work increases their climate anxiety. One of the proactive decisions or ideas that came forward though was uh, calling for a young mentors program where young people become the mentors and decision makers become the mentees. Now I can't speak for uh, other young people or other small businesses but for us it's very clear that our purpose is to practice business with nature for future generations. That involves things like B Corp and being part of the UN decade on ecosystem restoration and so on. But here my question is for the panel, how are you learning from younger generations of ecological entrepreneurs? And is there anyone who would be on this panel who would volunteer to be part of a program where you may be mentored by a young ecological entrepreneur? Thank you. Wonderful idea, wonderful challenge. And I also believe here, in the audience, there are that intergenerational and mentoring ability is critical. I think we have great elements for advancing this discussion. I will start with Joe. A lot of questions about public uh, interventions, and he and uh, and one specifically directed to you: incentives. Um, yes, thanks, and uh, I, I won't endeavour to answer all of these questions um, much as I would love mm. to. Uh, so, just quickly, when I when I spoke earlier, I did mention some of the positive uh, incentives that could be provided, uh, and I referred to things like taxes on pollution and resource use, uh, tradable permits, permits for fishing and water use, uh, biodiversity positive subsidies. Um, another uh, example, I think, uh, um, in New Zealand, where I came from, uh, was the in introduction of um, a tax on tourism uh, with the uh, uh, f funds that are generated being ploughed back uh, into ensuring, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the clean, green, uh, biodiverse image of New Zealand continued to, uh, uh, to thrive. Um, I... Just uh, uh, super quickly following up on that, um, you know, having come from COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh and coming here, uh, there are calls for means of implementation for finance um, in, in, in large, large numbers to deal with what has um, now, now being described as perma crises. Um, and the two we are, uh, are looking at here are, um, have been climate change and, of course, here at, the, at COP15, biodiversity. So we've got to be thinking two things. One is how can we use the finance that is there as cost-effectively as possible and in as mainstreamed a way as possible? Um, you know, we've tended to kind of treat these things a little bit in silos. Even within climate change, we've treated mitigation and adaptation um, as totally separate. We've seen biodiversity as separate again. We're all chasing um, a, a big pot of money, and while there's no shortage of funds around, it's not being directed uh, in, the, in the right uh, way. So nature-based solutions are one example of getting a triple win with mitigation, uh, with, uh, for example, improving the management of forests, grasslands, wetlands, agricultural lands, they're going to bring down uh, uh, emissions. They bring adaptation benefits um, with uh, um, green areas in, in urban centers, creating habitat for species, et cetera. Uh, and uh, they, they bring biodiversity uh, benefits as well. So related to that is the role of private finance. Um, and uh, one of the things we, we have at the OECD uh, been tracking and reporting on is, is uh, the uh, provision and, and mobilization of finance from a variety of sources uh, to support climate change. And that has shown that only a tiny percentage um, of the total is coming from the private sector. We've got to turn that around. Um, uh, create the conditions that mobilize, allow uh, the private sector finance and investment uh, to be uh, um, driven in support of both climate change and biodiversity outcomes. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you very much for covering a good number of important issues, highlighting 
nature-based solutions as well, and uh, uh, biodiversity positive strategies. I will now move to um, <clears throat> Diane, uh, because I think we heard very important points on, okay, maybe we give the impression we were focused on established business and not looking at those disrupting from within young entrepreneurs, mom and pops, uh, maybe from indigenous communities that depend on nature for their survival. How do we translate a global framework into actual concrete actions that they can implement? Thanks, Jorge. And I agree. I mean, these were amazing questions and insights for us to build on the conversation here with the great panel. There's a couple of ways, I think, of doing that. One is acknowledging the role of these great disruptor organizations who are coming up with the innovations quite often that are going to create the tipping points for investment. And we need to be able to unlock the finance. This is a great place where private finance can actually play a big role because it can come in small enough chunks versus the big um, sectoral finance investments that it can really help to scale those types of solutions. Another way that I think we'll see some fast transformation is that oftentimes these SME organizations are part of global value chains in some way. And with the commitments and the actions, once, um, once a company, a large multinational understands the materiality, its impacts and dependencies, as Elizabeth was saying, and begins to then very much target in on where are those investments and actions going to happen along that value chain? What are the scopes of influence that they need to do? Mm. They start to bring their value chain, their supply chain along with them. Mm. And that allows for an acceleration, a sharing of guidance and knowledge and action, and helping to set sometimes simpler targets to start with, which mm. is often needed when you're an SME. We don't have the capacity at that level to do the same level of broad capacity building that we do and often what we see in mm. the multinationals with the platforms that we come together and share around. And that's the third point that I'll reference is that, mm. you know, we've talked a lot about guidance tools, frameworks that are there that have been developed. They're mm. there to be able to be picked up, understood, implemented, and actioned. Not to say that that is an easy silver bullet solution, mm. but it means that SMEs, these smaller organizations, don't have to take the time to reinvent the capacity learning and understanding that it takes to actually embed that into how they assess their impacts, their opportunities, importantly, and the actions that they can then take and implement. That translation is therefore occurring ahead of perhaps their readiness, but then therefore when it can be plugged and played. So I think those are just a couple of key areas and ways that we engage SMEs, indigenous disruptors, into this opportunity that we face for both addressing the crisis, but also really building those business models mm. that we need for this next gen of work that we have to do. Thank you, thank you for, uh, for for that insight. I will move straight to to Julia because I believe this is very relevant for for, for travel and tourism industry. This, these uh, issues that we have heard and these messages. Um, just a couple of minutes, then I'll go to uh, Elizabeth and Mr. Shang Yugun, and if we were lucky, we may get a few more insights. That would be uh, wonderful. Over yeah, you. thank you very much, Jorge. I'd like to go from the macro to the micro. I think we are seeing some changes, shifts in subsidies, the Inflation Act in the in the USA, um, a lot of money there to incentivize private money to come in and to support some of these, and you will see big shifts. It's been done before in Europe. Governments incentivize electric vehicles over petrol vehicles, so the models are there. And I want to give a couple of examples. Um, I was working with a very small uh, entrepreneurial company that was taking household waste and using using a Fisher Trope technology, actually turning it into um, jet fuel, um, which is obviously we know the purest of the forms. Now they really really struggled because what they needed was some government backing, not for a massive amount amount of money, but some amount of money that then would open the doors to the private investors. The private investors were going to go there, but only if the government gave it a bit of backing. So again, we see how critical we are. About uh, young people, I would love to be uh, mentored. Um, I'm trying to, as I get older and older, learn more and more rather than less and less. So I would welcome that. In uh, WTTC, we've been working with a wonderful young woman called Malati. Many of you may know her. She and her sister, age 12, started Bye Bye Plastics in in Bali, and they changed the law in Bali um, so that 
plastics are now, and that was a 12 year old, two 12 year olds. She's the most incredible speaker and uh, I would recommend involving her and perhaps still quite young, Alexandra Cousteau, who's obviously Jacques Cousteau's granddaughter who, who is campaigning so incredibly about blue carbon and the health of our, um, of our oceans. One finally, um, what we did is we went out to our small and medium businesses in the hotel sector. 80% of the hotel sector are mum and pup or very small chains. They didn't know where to begin, literally, as you were saying, kind of, what do we do? We want mm. to do something. And we've put in place, it's called Hotel Sustainability Basics, and it is basics, and it's scientifically verifiable, and there are 12 12 points, they have to meet nine in the energy category, the community category, they have to meet this and it gets them on that first step and then they can be picked up by great organisations like Travelist that are really working in this field. So sorry, a bit of a higgledy-piggledy answer, but um, thank you, oh, great beautiful. question, thank you. Inspiring, and um, I'm going to move now to Elizabeth to share with us, there was a very important question, okay, once we adopt the framework, what's the role of the CBD the role of UNEP, uh, where the One Planet Network is nested, the role of the UN system in creating that uh, support for countries to actually speed implementation. Thank you. On that question, uh, the role of CBD, particularly defining a mandatory disclosure. One point, the frameworks already exist. So again, we are not reinventing the wheel. Uh, I'd indicated earlier uh, the focus in the past had been on climate action. Uh, there was a task force on climate uh, financial disclosure, which uh, had developed recommendations. They began voluntary. Now they are mandatory. So the companies already use them on a mandatory basis. I have the privilege also to serve as one of the co-chairs of the task force on nature related financial disclosure, where we are also developing a, a framework for assessing risks, impacts, and dependencies, and be able to report uh, and disclose on the same. We have already issued three releases. We are inviting companies to pilot test them uh, so that then uh, the framework is further developed uh, for its final release next year. And this framework already aligns squarely with the uh, global biodiversity framework. And once it is adopted, it will be further aligned before the final release next year. So the tools do exist, and many other tools do exist. Of course, we'll need to strengthen them. We'll need to use them. We'll need to build capacity on how best then they can be used, just the way as matrix tools data also will be done. So that is already happening. What signals will come from here? I think the fact that the business is engaged this much is an important signal that the business is on board, the business is ready to engage, and the business, I hope I'm not wrong, that will engage uh, in playing its part and its role in the implementation uh, of that framework when it is adopted. Financial sector, very much so uh, expected equally to be engaged. The framework is looking at financial flows from all sources, uh, uh, public, private, as well as domestic. Uh, so uh, the private sector is equally very much on board. In fact, uh, on the is it on the 14th, the day after tomorrow, we'll have a full day of biodiversity and finance. Again, discussing exactly these same issues, but looking from the financial sector perspective. With regards to the young people, the youth, the young are really engaged on nature, on biodiversity. They have had their own two-day summit here over 500 youth from all over the world, thanks to uh, the government of Quebec, which made it possible, bring the youth and have their own action plan. Within the CBD Secretariat itself, we have a fully fledged program for the youth where uh, they operate under the global network for youth uh, on biodiversity, 
with over 60 chapters uh, at our many chapters in over 60 countries and it's growing and they are actually taking action already on the ground and not waiting for, uh, for the framework. Indigenous local communities, this will be key particularly for business operations in those areas, particularly when it comes to agriculture, fisheries, uh, forest activities. Uh, and of course here we will have, uh, or there is uh, a call for 30 by 30 protected areas where indigenous population has uh, worried, scared, uh, whether they will have appropriate safeguards uh, to protect their land rights, their culture, their knowledge. As we know, 80% of well-managed biodiversity are in those areas uh, managed by just that 5% of the world population of indigenous peoples and local community. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, Mr. Shang uh, Jugung, um, do you have, uh, we've heard a number of insights in this uh, discussion. Uh, what is your take home message and possibly your response to some of the comments that have been made, including from the panel? Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you, representatives, delegates, for all the questions. I would like to comment and answer the questions on two parts. First of all, how will the government lead enterprises to take part in bi biodiversity protection? And just now a representative said, how can we strengthen young people's role in biodiversity conservation? First point. Now, the Chinese government had stated very clearly our development direction. During the 20th Congress, which was just concluded, there is the point about harmony and coexistence of humankind and nature. And when we modernize, we have to take a green, low-carbon transitional path. So after 2020, uh, this is actually in line with the uh, GBF uh, theory. Besides, the Chinese government is promoting uh, blue seas and uh, green mountains being equivalent to silver and gold mountains. So under that decision, we have confirmed our dual carbon goals and all the um, leading enterprises and top enterprises are tying their efforts with that. There are 36 Chinese banks and financial institutions and 24 foreign banks and also international organizations expressed support uh, to the advocation, advocacy of uh, biodiversity conservation and enterprises environmental protection will be enhanced and strengthened. Now, the Chinese government talked about a disclosure of environment information by enterprises according to law. And it is stated that enterprises must follow certain content and uh, formats and procedures in sharing environmental related information. In this area, of course, we have to, we have to gather all the effort from every aspect in the society to achieve our goal of the framework uh, that, everyone have, that everyone has drafted. But secondly, as I mentioned before, in terms of the awareness of the, the youth, the younger generation, I would say in China, we focus on this part quite a lot as well. <clears throat> By doing so, uh, every year we have a so-called six five. So every year on the 5th of January, uh, uh, every year on the 5th of June, we basically announce a new updated information in terms of uh, ecology, ecology and environment to, to basically attract more younger generation into environmental protection. And, and furthermore, we also do a lot of activities 
uh, locally um, by gathering all the activity for primary school students and high school students. Uh, in terms of in terms of having a thematic topics on uh, of uh, environmental protection. So sometimes there are a dozen of pupils uh, join in these kind of activities. And um, also from the department I am personally in, and every year we basically invite all the member of staff, their kids, to enjoy these kind of activities. <laughs> So we will say this kind of activity are quite creative in terms of uh, having a thematic um, activity in terms of <laughs> environmental protection. So basically, that's all the effort we have been putting in so far. Thank you. Take home message is very simple. A nature positive, a nature positive approach for businesses is not only possible, it's actually happening. We are in a moment of crisis and we are also in a moment of opportunity. There is, as an outcome of this conference, a great opportunity to come with a strong framework that helps companies, I insist, assess, that means measure, value, prioritize their impacts, propose and promote and scale up innovative business models, disrupt from within, commit, at the highest levels and having CEOs engaging at the highest levels shifts strategies towards culture, making positive culture in business, overall transform our current trajectories by using the power of business, but also the power of governments, right? And that we heard it. We cannot do it without both. I will add one important message from my part. It's the power of consumers that are informed and for that we need ambitious measurable implementable targets especially that are there we are encouraged we call on negotiators to adopt ambitious targets 15 16 and others that will impact provide the signals to transform the business models it has been a real pleasure to me to be part of this discussion, to hear some of your insights. We have a whole day ahead of us uh, for more dialogue, for more interaction. This is just launching an important conversation that we'll hope will conclude with messages that impact the negotiations. I want to thank Diane, thank you for your insights, Julia, Joe, Shang, and of course my friend Elizabeth, thank you for setting time aside and especially to you, let's give yourselves a round of applause. We had a full house, and this has been a very, very interesting opening panel for the forum. Thank you. Um, we're going to adjourn the panel, and we're going to hear from our wonderful moderator, Gaby, what's next for us. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you, Jorge, and, and thank you, everyone. Um, that was really inspiring, and I think the, the take-home message being the need to transform and disrupt. I, I really loved that. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to ask you to exit the stage, and we can then introduce the, the next speaker, um, who could not be with us in person, unfortunately, um, but he's going to be connected live to deliver his inspiring keynote address. Mr. Jeffrey Sachs is president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, co-chair of the Council of Engineers for the Energy Transition, and commissioner of the UN Broadband Commission for Development. Mr. Sachs has been special advisor to three United Nations Secretaries General and currently serves as an SDG advocate under Secretary General Antonio Guterres. Welcome, Mr. Sachs. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the honor uh, and the opportunity to be with you in this important forum at this important juncture. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, the toughest part of the entire transformation agenda. Uh, getting sustainable land use and sustainable agriculture. If you think the energy transformation is hard, I'm afraid this one is even harder. Uh, we face a, a, a more complex set of uh, challenges, a more uh, differentiated and varied array of conditions around the world and far less clarity to this point of what actually to do. So let me uh, just give
give a brief conceptualization of this uh, issue of sustainable land use and agriculture. And by that, uh, I mean many things, including protecting biodiversity, but also contributing to the climate agenda. Uh, explain why it's so difficult, uh, and then uh, give some thoughts about the way forward. And I'll uh, continue to make some comparisons with the energy transformation agenda along the way. We, we have uh, three huge crises in uh, the food and agriculture sector, which is the predominant uh, part of the overall land use and marine use challenge. So the first is that the land use sector, especially driven by agriculture and forestry, is itself the number one contributor by far to anthropogenic environmental degradation. And even when you restrict attention just to greenhouse gas emissions, the land use sector is number one. As I'm sure everybody knows, uh, land use and agriculture contribute around 30% of all greenhouse gas emissions. It's astounding. That's CO2 for the energy inputs. It's methane uh, from uh, the ruminant uh, animals, especially cattle. Uh, it's methane from uh, the anaerobic respiration in uh, rice paddies. It's nitrous oxide from the volatilization of fertilizer, which is absolutely essential for the global food supply and more. So the first part of this challenge is that the land use sector is absolutely not sustainable. It is uh, the cause of deforestation, of land degradation, of greenhouse gas emissions, of water depletion. Uh, for example, the groundwater uh, use in the Indo-Gangetic Plain and many other parts of the world. Second, of the 8 billion people on the planet today, at least 3 billion do not have uh, adequate levels of nutrition. Another 1 billion are badly malnourished by processed foods and by dietary composition, and that's where the obesity epidemic has arisen. But for 3 billion people, we have uh, the sheer hunger of uh, undernourishment, uh, both the caloric intake and protein sufficiency, and we have the massive micronutrient defi deficiencies uh, pervasive in so much of the developing world. So our starting point on land use is we're not even feeding the planet right now. Uh, and uh, yet the population continues to increase at net 60 million per year, roughly. So sometime around 2037, we'll reach 9 billion people and so forth. And we have a massive, massive food crisis with uh, undernutrition uh, at the core. Then the third uh, part of this conundrum is that the food and land use sector is absolutely not resilient to the environmental changes that are taking place, to the climate change and all of its consequences, and to the land degradation itself. When it comes to the climate change, I don't have to recite the obvious facts that high temperatures and uh, distortions uh, to the hydrologic cycle and the uh, loss of uh, biodiversity because of thermal stress or migration of species means that we are in the midst already of more and more climate-related food crises, famines, flooding that destroys crops, uh, thermal stress that reduces yields, uh, 
water stress uh, that uh, impedes uh, yields or destroys crops. So we don't have even the basic resilience to uh, the, the food sector. So you add this up that our food sector is not sustainable in its uh, anthropogenic effects. It's not delivering its core function of adequate diets for a large part of the world. And it's not resilient to the changes underway. Uh, now, it's worse, actually, because we don't have a plan. We don't have a framework of action. And let me make the analogy to the energy sector. Back in 1992, when CBD was signed and the UNFCCC was signed, uh, we didn't have a plan for either the energy transformation or the biodiversity conservation. We had tools. We knew that renewable energy would be some part of this. We knew that protected reserve areas would be some part of the solution for uh, biodiversity. We knew that limits on fishing or harvesting of uh, tropical uh, forests and so forth would be part of the solution, but we didn't have a, an overall plan. It took really uh, almost 30 years to even arrive at the framework for the energy transformation, because for a long time we had the guidance, uh, uh, stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations to avoid dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system, but we didn't know what that meant in practical terms. Then in 2015, there were clear, uh, well, almost clear, limits uh, adopted for uh, warming, I say almost clear because I've studied well below two degrees C without knowing exactly what well below meant, and aimed to stay below 1.5 degrees C. Then the IPCC uh, translated that into decarbonize by mid-century. Then that led to a flurry, hundreds of studies of what that path to mid-century could mean to decarbonize by mid-century. And what we finally realized, I think in the last two years only or three years, is that almost every study had the same structural uh, outcomes, which is create a zero carbon power sector, electrify as much of the economy as possible, and for the parts that can't be electrified, use synthetic uh, zero carbon uh, energy sources such as hydrogen. And that's the game plan now all over the world. Of course, even till today, most countries do not have detailed roadmaps of the public investments and the public policies needed to achieve these goals. I would ask you, do we have a comparable uh, analog in the area of biodiversity conservation and sustainable food and agriculture, for example, SDGs 2, 14, and 15. I would argue, no, we don't. We don't have uh, a target that is comparable to stay below uh, 1.5 degrees C which I hope is the essence of what comes out of COP15. But even if we have such a target, we don't have a clear roadmap as to what that means. Where is the food going to be produced within countries? What are the right boundaries? How to respect the biodiversity, the hydrologic conditions, the uh, greenhouse gas conditions and the food production needs. How will international trade uh, help to shape and help to facilitate, I should add, meeting these multiple complex objectives? How does dietary change, most notably reduced beef eating, quantitatively 
uh, contribute to this? And how could it be accomplished, of course, since it's such behavioral changes are extremely difficult to bring about and extremely controversial, unfortunately, even though there is movement in this direction. So what I am strongly urging of FAO, and I think partners with UNEP, with the, uh, with the, um, uh, the World Food Program, with EFAD, with CGIAR, and with others, is a roadmap to 2050 that is akin to the roadmaps to 2050 for the energy transformation. I have no doubt, as the previous speakers on the panel were just saying, that many businesses want to contribute. Many businesses have advanced technologies. Many businesses uh, are absolutely committed. But I also do believe that unless we have an overarching framework with clear objectives, with a globally understood roadmap, with an identification of the role of intra-regional and inter-regional trade in agricultural commodities, and with a corresponding policy portfolio akin to the carbon pricing or the emissions trading, we will not be able to uh, achieve this extraordinarily central and utterly complex challenge. So my main message is bold and clear targets, strong analytical pathways to how those targets can be achieved, and policy frameworks in governments and at the regional level, the African Union, ASEAN, uh, the South American nations, uh, the European Union, uh, at the strong regional level of cooperation to put the policy and framework in place to achieve the pathways. We're very late in the day. I think the urgency is a, should be apparent to all. We've got a lot of homework ahead, uh, and I know uh, people want to roll up their sleeves uh, to, to do that work. Thank you very much for letting me share a few remarks with you today. Thank you, everyone. I, I hope you're all as, as moved as I am right now. Um, I think it really, really hit home. Um, and so let's, let's take a breather and let's take a break. Um, we're going to take a, a short break and please be back here at exactly 11.10 sharp for the next session focusing on embedding biodiversity into, into business. Thank you.
start taking our seats, please? I hope everyone got the time to kind of chat amongst yourselves and discuss new things and be inspired and be scared and then be re-inspired again. Um, it's a it's a roller coaster of emotions when when you're dealing with with these sorts of big issues and hearing from so many incredible experts. So welcome back um, and thank you for for being back here. Um, I would like to introduce you all to our next facilitator um, for another panel. Um, Ms. Katya Kurosakis, who is the Biodiversity Program Leader for the Environment, Transitions and Resilience Division of the Environment Directorate at the OECD. Katya, welcome, and the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, so my name is Katya Kurosakis. I'm at the OECD, and it's my deep uh, pleasure and privilege uh, to be moderating this next session uh, today uh, during the Business and Biodiversity Forum, which was on embedding biodiversity in business. And I'd just like to start by saying that it is indeed so encouraging to see the engagement from the business sector here at CBD COP15 today and the growth in the number of commitments and initiatives um, that are emerging, as well as the different um, calls for further action. Um, it's also been great, um, I think, over the past few years to also see momentum um, from a number of international organizations, um, studies from the World Economic Forum, highlighting, for example, that biodiversity is now perceived to be a top global risk um, to society. Um, different studies, whether it's from us on the economic and business case for action, um, the Descopta reviews, others, so more and more evidence building, different perspectives coming together on the need for, for business um, action in the context of biodiversity. And I will say, given the very um, sort of critical juncture we are here at today, it's a very different feeling and a very different buzz, I think, from where we were 10 years ago um, um, during the, the negotiation for the, for, the, for the initial framework and the HE targets. And I really do hope that in five to 10 years from now, we will be in an even more different place. Um, and indeed, we will need to see continuous um, innovation and uh, a rapid rapidity sort of in the, in the speed with which we, we take on further action. Um, and hopefully to also have uh, measures in place in the next five, 10 years to be able to be more consistently monitor our progress and to assess whether we are on track and what more we need to do as we move forward. So this session is on embedding biodiversity into business. Um, following the high-level panel, we had uh, the opening session and the excellent overview by Jeffrey Sachs. We will now get to hear more about the nuts and bolts of how business is engaging in biodiversity um, and what motivates them, um, and also hear from the government sector on their perspectives on how we can uh, build further momentum in, in the context of business and biodiversity. So with that, I would like to uh, begin to call on the excellent panelists that, are, that will be joining us today. Um, first, please, Denise Hills, Sustainability Director at Natura & Co. If I could ask you to uh, join us up, up here together. <clears throat> Catherine Remy, 
uh, from Total Energies as well, VP, please join us as well over here. Takao Aiba, Chair uh, Planning from Kaidarainen Committee on Nature Conservation. Welcome. <laughs> Geraldine Vallejo, um, Sustainability Program Director at Caring. <laughs> Bonjour. Xiang Zhujun, Director General at Environment Corporation Center, Ministry of Ecology and Environment in China. And Andrea Ledward, uh, International Biodiversity and Climate Director at the UK Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. So. Welcome everyone. This one doesn't work, oh, it does work, okay, lovely. So there's also one more, two more glasses of water here in case anyone would like that afterwards, if just to let you know. Um, so first of all, uh, very nice to be here with all of you here today. Um, and I'd like you uh, to ask each of you to briefly um, share your perspective. So uh, first round to share your perspective um, on why biodiversity matters for business um, from, yeah, from, from your own perspective. Uh, institution, government, organization. And can I please start with Denise? So thank you. It's, it's so nice for me to see a big home like this discussing biodiversity as a businesses. So I'd like to, to congratulate many of you and all of us to put the biodiversity into the discussion in the middle of the business. And now uh, I'm Dennis Hughes, I'm representing Natura. I don't know if many of you know, Natura is a cosmetic company, a Brazilian company that has part today as a group that has operation more than uh, 100,000, uh, 110 uh, countries. And we are dedicated and we know that our business nowadays comes from the biodiversity. Biodiversity is for us a source of uh, enormous and innovative social and economic uh, development. It, Natura has uh, our operations in Brazil, which is their headquarters for Natura, in the last 55 years, 54 or 5 years, and in the last 20 years. We start a business, one of the most innovative and incredible, for many of you, um, value chain that comes from the biodiversity. But it's not a simple value chain. It is since 2008, we start not only increase our operations globally, but the innovation, the name in the purpose, uh, the purpose of the group that we are now called Commitment to Life, address biodiversity, not only in our commitments, but in our decision-making process, in our innovation area. Let me explain a little bit about the historic key approach of it. In 2009, we decide as a strategic approach, look through the Amazon as a super fount of inspiration and to the biodiversity as a source of innovation for the company. Since that, we are developing together with more than 85 communities at the Amazon, 41 ingredients, and which are now represents the base of the whole cosmetic develop and innovative um, products that we have. And because of it, we address directly um, 2 million hectares of preservation of forests and with economic value, with the impact, with in many of the ways uh, measuring the, the gains for the forest, the gains in terms of restoration and preservation, the development uh, of a social, bio, social biodiversity economy. We measure this kind of impact and we see ourselves as a good example of things that can be done when you look through the bio biodiversity, not only for a risks, but um, an opportunity to, to transform social and environmental risks into opportunity, including for businesses. For me, the discussion today connecting biodiversity in businesses 
is the opportunity to connect, to use this, to think for nature, not, uh, not even as a problem to, that has solution, but to connect nature in the spirit of uh, without nature, there is no business. Without nature, there is no breed. There is no like hungry. We will see like um, uh, many scarcities, but uh, if I remember my past life, you know, coming from climate change agenda, I used to be a UNAP negotiator. I had an opportunity to develop the SDGs in Brazil, in the Latin America, and have a long term experience dealing with climate change agenda. I saw biodiversity in the discussions that we have today as a COP15 for biodiversity and inspired by the uh, advance that we have in terms of climate agenda in the last like 10 years, I see myself in our company in Brazil in Amazon as a solution and something that could be a very important part to address the challenge that we have here. Thank you very much, Denise, and especially on why biodiversity matters for business. And you say, well, without biodiversity, there is no business. So <laughs> very clear signal there. Um, Catherine, can I pass over to you to ask the same question? What from your, um, to share your perspective on why biodiversity matters for, for your business? Indeed, we can address the, the why biodiversity matters from a, um, a global business perspective, I would say, and, and then focus on, on what it means for us, um, Total Energies being a multi-energy company. From a global business perspective, I think we've said it over the past few days already, um, over than, um, more than half of the global GDP on Earth depends on nature. So it's about revenues, and not only revenues, but risks as well, because of the biodiversity crisis, because of the climate crisis, it's, it's a risk for our asset at the private company. So it's as well linked to insurance. So a global answer to that would be, it's about revenues, as you mentioned, and it's about risks as well. Now focusing more on, um, on total energies, what does it mean for us? And why do we care? First and foremost, I, I should highlight the, the, the fact that we recognize the nexus between biodiversity and climate. We are currently facing a dual crisis of biodiversity loss and climate change, and they are twin crises. And as such, it should be dealt with together and not separately. And the energy sector has definitely, in this context, a key role to play in addressing those twin crises. Because a healthy ecosystem plays its full role in the global carbon value chain in nature. And it's, it provides its full benefit to humanity with its ecosystem services. Now to be more concrete on our direct impact, um, as an energy company, as I said, we have developed um, a few years ago um, uh, an activity which is based on bioenergies. Um, most of you know it, it's, it has um, a lower um, carbon footprint uh, less than half the carbon footprint of a, of, of a fossil fuel. So what do we do concretely? Well, we generate biogas on our infrastructure using as feedstock uh, waste from the agriculture. We generate as well biofuel using as feedstock at the entry of our sites, some um, waste and residues, um, animal fat, vegetable oil, you name it. All those are direct dependencies on nature. And then in our daily operation, we do as well have some dependency. Here again, I, I, I refer to um, a healthy ecosystem as a whole. So playing its role of um, filtering water, of um, retaining the soil, this is key for whatever I said you operate, right, on, on the ground. But we also have an indirect link to it. To, to, to this why biodiversity matters. And I must emphasize this, uh, that for a private company, especially like ours, what's at stake for us is also, I think, our license to operate. It's about attracting and retaining talents. It's, it's about our reputation, which to some extent 
is um, a contributor to external partnership and to government support. And I want to put flesh on the bone on this one because I think that this is happening. Biodiversity matters. It's, it's, for us, it's, as I said, it's part of our license to operate. And last but not least, we as businesses, we should take action just because this is the right thing to do. We are going through a dual climate and biodiversity crisis. We support the Paris Agreement and the CBD with its objectives. We are all part of the problem. And we businesses, Total Energies included, are part of the solution. We, we see ourselves as um, corporate citizens, and as such, this is the right thing to do. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for, for, those, uh, for that intervention. And I'll pass over again for the same question to Takao. Yeah, thank you very much. And my name is Takao Weber, and uh, I'm here on behalf of Keidan Lem, Committee on Nature Conservation which was so established in 1992 and uh, when the Rio Sustainability Conference was held. And we have 30 years of experience. And the Keidan Land, so Japan Business Federation is the largest business organization in Japan. And I'm also, also working for Toyota Motor Corporation. And uh, so, first of all, I'd like to so extend my sincere so gratitude to all organizers and the uh, so chairs and distinguished speakers and the, for this spur panel discussion. I'm quite honored to be a part of this wonderful panel. And uh, why biodiversity matter for business? So I agree with the so previous speakers. And it's easy to say that biodiversity and natural capital as socioeconomic fundamental for human beings and maybe all business activities. Our business activity is highly dependent on nature contribution to people or maybe ecological services or ecosystem. So biodiversity conservation is indispensable base of our business activity. And uh, as a business of Japan, this, so, of Japan, so we are proud of our long and rich Japanese culture. Japanese culture has been side by side with nature for a long time. It's more than 1,000 year so history. And holding nature in all, we respect traditionally, so natural wisdom and view concerning coexistence with nature or harmony with nature. So for Japanese business, it's quite natural to respect for nature. And so we have so long-term view and so very keen on sustainability. So nature conservation is matter of course for Japanese business. And uh, also the, according to the so survey by World Economic Forum, so the so the more than four, 44 trillion US dollar of economic value is highly dependent on nature. And also maybe transitioning to nature positive economy would create maybe 400 million additional employment and the 10 trillion US business chance. So fast mover may have a chance to take such advantage. And uh, also, I'd like to so introduce some info about our questionnaire survey for among some member companies, and uh, which we are conducting periodically for more than 10 years. We saw some progress in mainstreaming business, uh, biodiversity in business. And the latest, so the results showed, and uh, actually more than 75% of member company have already incorporated biodiversity conservation with their management policy. But at the same time, they are pointing out some difficulty, actually. So such as difficulty in quantifying dependencies and the impact, or difficulty in making economic evaluation or setting metrics and target, and also difficulty in making profit, and also the, some say the weak connectivity to main business and so on. Especially for many industries in Japan whose impact on nature mainly happening in global value chain, it is a very so superb challenge to obtain reliable traceability and accurately visualize dependency and impact. 
And uh, so internalizing externality such as biodiversity value depends on domestic policy measures, which are considerably different region by region. So if global framework creates level playing field, it would be significant for step. And we expect such kind of situation and uh, so to the, such an environment make business to do more. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Takao, and also for making the link to the post-20 global biodiversity framework and the fact that indeed a lot of um, action from business sector can be incentivized and motivated by policies and also referring to the issue of the negative externalities, the need to internalize these so that we are on a sort of a biodiversity positive um, pathway. So thanks very much for that. I'd now like to pass um, to Geraldine for the same question, also from your perspective from caring, the fact that your house work with, together on top sort of with Gucci and a number of other brands, etc. Could you tell us from your perspective why biodiversity matters for business? Yes, thank you, Katia. Thank you for the invitation. So caring, we are an international luxury group and we manage the development of uh, renowned houses like Gucci, Saint Laurent, you name it. And uh, why biodiversity matters? But, uh, because all richness comes from biodiversity in the world. Everything starts with nature and biodiversity. And so our business um, depends on biodiversity and healthy ecosystems for raw materials such as leather, cashmere, silk, etc. Our products begin their life in farms, rangelands, forests. We have to keep this in mind. But um, we already see the impacts of climate change and biodiversity loss. And this has a direct impact on the availability and on the quality of the materials that we get. Additionally, uh, nature and biodiversity is a fantastic source of inspiration and creativity for our uh, um, artistic uh, teams. So it has both a very uh, uh, material approach, but also emotional approach that we should not forget about biodiversity. So overall, um, we, we believe that protecting and restoring um, biodiversity is both an ethical imperative and a business imperative. And this is something that we have taken seriously, very seriously for over a decade uh, at Caring. We uh, implement the mitigation hierarchy by avoiding, reducing, uh, restore, regenerate, and transform, transform, sorry. Avoiding, very important, that our sourcing standards are very stringent and that our, uh, we have the full traceability that we mentioned, that we work on towards the full traceability so, to ensure that there is no link to deforestation or soil degradation in our supply chain. Um, restore and regenerate, I will come back on this later, and also transform in, is key. We want to play a role in engaging the whole uh, fashion and luxury industry in better understanding its dependencies with biodiversity and, active, um, and have an active um, uh, word on and actions toward a positive impact on biodiversity. Thank you very much for that, uh, Geraldine. And also, I just want to, it's interesting to hear you and also Catherine, you talked about the ethical imperative to integrate biodiversity in decision making, and you were referring to that it's the right thing to do. And that might well be the case. I mean, I'm sure you May, might agree with a lot of people here as uh, front runners, leaders, but there might also be a number of other businesses that are not following suit according, you know, with those sort of motivations in mind. Um, so uh, to that, with that in mind, I'd like to now turn to um, sort of the two panelists from the government, with government, you know, having a role to play in providing public goods, um, you know, and, um, environmental health, also for social health, etc. And I'd like to pass the same question to both of you, um, starting with Zhang Zhujun. Um, why, from your perspective, does biodiversity matter for business, and and why? Yeah, why is it important? Okay, uh, thanks to the facilitator. 
Uh, a good, good day to everyone. Uh, I'm very delighted to join with you again in this section. And uh, <clears throat> on behalf of Foreign Environmental Cooperation Office of the Ministry of in Ec Ecology and Environment of China and uh, China's Partnership for Business and Biodiversity, uh, I uh, would deliver my thanks to the uh, secretary to the, to the secretary for the invitation. And as to the question uh, mentioned by the facilitator, why bi business matters uh, to biodiversity, uh, actually uh, the previous spe speakers have given a very, comp pre very comprehensive responses. If I shall add to them, I would make the following uh, three points for your reference. <clears throat> Firstly, to varying degrees, all businesses uh, depend and impact on nature and its uh, products uh, and services. Uh, however, uh, the impact drivers and pathway and dependence pathways, as well as the mitigating approaches to achieve biodiversity net zero loss, vary from industry to industry, and from business to business. Therefore, uh, the companies shall identify them <clears throat> and measure and assess them based on the value chain characteristics of their sector and report on regular basis. Secondly, according to a report released by WEF last year, three key socio-economic systems, agri-food, energy extraction and infrastructure covering dozens of related industries, market segments and banking sectors which provide funds from upstream are particularly dependent and impactful on biodiversity. Their transition to nature positive is urgent and this is the common challenge to all countries. Finally, business dependency on nature can think on the positive side, stimulate technical innovation and industrial up upgradation, and contribute to the country's economic restructuring and high quality development. Business impact will also lead to better integration of e effective governments and efficient market. For instance, business and biodiversity offsetting program allows EcoBank to sell the net gains achieved from pr protected areas to businesses, which is a good way to offset the business impact on nature. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you also for raising a very specific type of mechanism to help incentivize business, which is biodiversity offsets. Uh, so thanks for making it more pragmatic and practical as well. Um, and now I'd like to pass on to Andrea also for the same, the question on why biodiversity matters for business. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think what I'll start by saying is just a few points capturing um, others' comments on why biodiversity matters and then talk about why the negotiations that are happening here matter. So just first, the fact is that um, a million species are at risk of extinction. We know that three quarters of the world's global food supply is dependent on pollinators. And we know that you don't get to one and a half degrees if you don't start thinking about land use, forestry and agriculture. And that you also don't come up with solutions to support the most vulnerable in the world and adapt to the impacts of climate change if you're not thinking about nature-based solutions. So it's absolutely critical that we start thinking about the global GDP, as others have said, which is dependent on biodiversity. It's absolutely critical that we start thinking about the economic opportunities, the fact that we won't have innovation, we won't have uh, new drugs being developed, we won't have new um, foodstuffs if we don't start thinking about uh, protecting the nature that we have and increasing um, and addressing the biodiversity loss. And then finally, I think on, our, on supply chains, it's again, it's the point about risk which um, is that at the moment, many businesses know that they have risk within their supply chains. Um, and that's risks at different levels. That's either risks because of their dependency on nature, that's risks because of their, um, their impacts on nature, 
Um, and that's also reputational risks about what um, companies are actually driving through their supply chains if they're not fully factoring in um, nature. So you then might wonder, well, what's the, what's the role of the CBD and, and why do we need a new global biodiversity framework um, to do that? I think it's absolutely critical that we um, agree a global biodiversity framework here that commits to a 2050 mission with a clear suite of goals and targets to be achieved by 2030. Only that will then set the right um, trajectory and set the right incentives to move together. Um, we think it's very important that also people are looking hard at the targets 14 and 16 that are being negotiated because actually what they demonstrate is the fact that in biodiversity loss and climate change really cuts across society at all levels and we really need to think hard about mainstreaming biodiversity. And then there's also target 15 that I'm sure many of you are focused on which is particularly looking at how businesses should be monitoring, assessing um, their impacts and their dependencies and the negative impacts. So I think the point the whole panel has made, which is that you know biodiversity matters, it's an integral part of both risk and opportunity. Um, and you can see that translated through to the framework that's under negotiation here in those um, very particular areas. So thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, and also for making the link to uh, numerous targets in the, in the post-2020 global biodiversity framework that can help to incentivize um, uh, biodiversity and to integrate mainstream biodiversity in business. So we've heard on the sort of high-level perspectives um, on why biodiversity is important. Um, and I'd like to now move to the second round of discussion, which is uh, going into a little bit more depth, if you like. And I'll start again with Denise with a specific question to you. So Denise, biodiversity is not a new topic for Natura. I love the name of your company as well. It fits perfectly for, for this particular event. Can you share with us three main reasons why, in your perspective, biodiversity should be at the heart of decision making? And also, what is motivating you to integrate biodiversity in decision making? I think it's a, a one of the, the most important questions that I've been answered in life. I love the idea of like uh, representing a company that has in the name nature as part of our purpose. Thank you for remembering me. In case of Natura, which are, as I mentioned, a cosmetic company, biodiversity is in our foundation of our business model. That's why. We currently have like more than 90% of the, the products, Natura portfolio, that are or vegan and 90, 93%, if I remember the correct name, are vegan and 94% are plant-based, uh, which means that so conservation, restoration, or the understanding of nature of biodiversity as a fount of our of a fount of the business, a fount of the innovation, it's critical for us. It's our business model. So I, I hope we have like that just because we can be done in a long term ago, in a long term perspective, we could be an inspiration of what kind of business we are discussing here. There is no business without nature and there is a better business with nature business can be a, a true force for good. I think one of the discussions about our whole as a leaders here, our person as a leadership inside of our companies is the ability to promote a long-term perspective in a moving forward strategy going from here, the business as we know nowadays for the future. So the second one, uh, as I, I mentioned, I could I could mention many examples of how a standing forest, in my case, could be more value for everyone, for the people that live over there, for the companies that were operating with the nature, for the governments which are having and dealing with many issues regarding social and environmental problems as the economic problems in terms of the solutions that it can be done. But last, uh, I would love to mention one, and uh, many of you know, could try after as a, a a very nice chat. Uh, I would love to mention like the Ukuba tree example. Ukuba was a tree that was uh, extinct into the Amazon. And because when we are mapping 
the alternatives in terms of oils and butter for cosmetic companies for, for us, we develop an, an innovation approach that transforms an extinct tree in a font of 10 times more uh, results in terms of finance, results in terms of investments for the community and generate one of the most uh, essential products in our line. Ukuba is, uh, has the ability, it comes from the Amazon bioma, and it has the ability to regenerate your skin in like 24 hours. And that's why you have like an importance to see biodiversity as a fount of the innovation. Many of you, and many of the companies are not thinking of nature as part of their business, but we should look to nature as an inspiration as we saw nowadays. There is no agriculture without biodiversity. We, there is no many things that we already know without biodiversity. So the second point is nature is the fount of the inspiration, is the innovative approach for the economics, for the development, for the businesses. And in the third one, I'd love to, to talk about bioeconomy. Bioeconomy with nature-based solution can be the best way to generate prosperity and profit in that order. I'd like to mention an experience that we have. We are truly dedicated to measure our impact. Last year, we launched an, a mechanism, a tool, which we call an integrated PNL. PNL is a common science in the business side. Everyone knows about the PNL, but integrate social environmental aspects and measure the output, the outcome and the impact of your business shows us how to take or having better decisions into the decision making process inside of the company. And I would love to, to mention that in 2021, when we measure the return of our operations in Natura Works into the Amazon, now we are saying that Every single dollar that we invest there generates 8.6 dollars in terms of uh, natural, social, and economic impact for the region. Because it's combined, the impact that we have, like paying for sharing benefits, things that we are discussing here, paying for the value of restore a forest instead of devastate the forest. And how could we imagine that one dollar that we have invested on generates this kind of development, this kind of impact. And this is the true value of the company, the value for the society, development that we have for the, the biomas, the local that we are operating. And according to IPNL, because of it, we transform the IPNL, the measurement, and that's why it's so important we have been discussing here about framework, about common standards, about public information that we are going to mention in the last round. And we have now a mechanism, including the mechanism is public in order to promote that other companies could use. But the real value of the company is not one real in terms of PNL or one dollar, but the real value of Kone company is the ability to promote this kind of output, outcome, and impact as a part of the decision-making process in order to promote and decide with a better impact. For the end, and just for to start in the next round, I would love to share one of the not good things or not good news about the forest. From the beginning of this panel until the end, 1,050 trees for the Amazon will be fallen because we not have yet many business like this that could look to the forest as a part of a system which allows us to live and as a business, as part of a regeneration or part of a, a new approach of businesses that restores and preserves at the same time that generates results. So. We see ourselves as an incentive of things that can be done. We have no, many of companies has no opportunity to have like to, to born like us, but we can share the expertise that we have in, in order to go forward faster and dedicated 
using technology as a business to promote a better business for the world. Thank you so much, Denise. And also, I have to say, I mean, I I do find numbers compelling, and it's really interesting to see that just what you said, uh, one dollar investment yields eight. 8.6 in in returns to society, if you like, yeah, um, fantastic. Uh, would be interesting, I think, to see that study if it's available and if uh, okay, wonderful, um, and others to undertake similar work like that so that we can gather the evidence and build the case for further action also from others. Um, I'll now pass the floor to Catherine with a specific question. Um, as we know, energy production and use um, has uh, leads to obviously greenhouse gas emissions and also adverse impacts on biodiversity. Can you please tell us what steps Total Energies is taking to address these? This is actually like a three-part question, so I'm just going to go slow here. Um, what steps Total Energies is taking to address these? And what kinds of outcomes and impacts you expect on the ground, so over time? And finally, also, how is any progress intended to be measured or monitored? Thank you. Thank you very much. Indeed, the 2019 IPBES reports um, list the climate change as the third driver for global biodiversity loss after the land use change, so that's agriculture and, and soil artificialization, and natural resources over exploitation, like overfishing. So our main answer to, to this dual crisis, crisis is our global climate strategy. It is to be carbon neutral, to be net zero by 2050, together with society. This is in line with the Paris Agreement, and, and, and we, have, uh, we, we had it externally verified. But let, let's be concrete, because it's not just about words, what we are sharing here in this room. And so let me share with you the way, the, the way we do it uh, in a multi-energy company like Total Energies. We structure what we do is, first, what we do with respect to our direct operation, that's scope one and two. And then what we do with respect to our um, Indirect impact, I would say, which is our scope three. Scope three, you have a number of categories for us. The main one is the use of our product by our clients. So for scope one and two, we apply the mitigation hierarchy. So we go for avoid, reduce, and compensate. What does it mean? For many of our sites around the world, most of them are remote, and we need some power generation package. Uh, and here, what we mean by avoid is that the, the, the base case will be to go and produce power for the site using renewable power. And if it cannot be done, because sometimes it's not possible, we go at least for an hybrid solution. This is typically what we are doing at the moment uh, in the current engineering studies we're carrying out for Iraq. So this is the, the, the avoidance, right? Reduce. Reduce is about reducing our scope one and two on our existing installation. We've set up a dedicated task force internally, uh, the Carbon Footprint Reduction Department. I think the name uh, speaks for itself. And they have a number of, um, of targets that they follow. Um, an example that can be meaningful to you is, and that I can share is what we do with respect to the, to the methane leaks that we sometimes have on some of our sites. They're very light ones, but we need to track those down um, as indeed they, have a, that they can have a strong impact. And we've, we've done that already in Nigeria, in Congo, in Netherlands and in Angola. And as for the compensate, we've set uh, a department, an NBS department, Natural Based Solution Department, which is exclusively focusing on offsetting our uh, GHG residual emission uh, for scope one and two. And we spend roughly a um, hundred million dollars per year on this, on this department. This is another example of uh, dependency on opportunities on nature. 
And for scope three, which is very important for a company like us, um, when I shared with you that we want to be net zero by 2050 together with society, it's not just words. We're working uh, hard on our energy mix. And what does it mean? It means that we invest a lot in the renewable energies. Our focus is wind power and solar power. As I said, it's not just world. In 2022, we invested $4 billion in new projects. This is comparable to what a, a pure player would invest. And it's uh, twice the average of the, of the industry. And so we have a target. Uh, currently, we have 12 gigawatts of installed uh, renewable power. We're targeting 100 gigawatts by 2030. 100 gigawatts of installed uh, power generation capacity. 100 gigawatts, to give you an order of magnitude, this is what you have for Canada as we speak in terms of renewable uh, uh, capacity generation. And how we do that? Uh, so we work on greenfield development. And more importantly, we leverage on our position worldwide because we have affiliates all around the world. Some of those are located in historical oil and gas country, I would say. And we leverage this position to offer some renewable solution. I'll give you an example. Just a few weeks ago, we inaugurated um, a solar plant in Al Kharsa in Qatar, 800 megawatts. That's huge. And we gave green light in Angola uh, to Kilimba Solar, which is a um, 35 plus megawatt solar plant. So if I share this with you, it's, it's to, to, to give you some, some example of, of the fact that it's not, a, it's not just a, on the side of the business as usual. This is built in in our, in our strategy indeed. And how do we progress the measure that we do? Uh, well, being a French company, headquarters in France, we have to report on those on a yearly basis. So all our results are reported, audited, and verified by an independent third party. And this has been the case for some years already. Because France was uh, one of the first countries to make uh, climate reporting mandatory. Thank you. Uh, you're finished, right? Okay, I was. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. So thanks very much, and thanks for also letting us know. Yeah, that uh, reporting on climate is mandatory, and I know also now in France they've introduced recent laws also for. Uh, Monitoring, I think, for biodiversity as well, right? Is that well, yeah, and and we're doing those as well. I I I, I focus on the on the climate part, but we are sharing as well some some biodiversity indeed metrics. Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I'll now pass. I'll ask a, pose a question to Geraldine. Um, we know that measuring impacts on biodiversity is a challenge for companies around the world. Um, and caring you, at caring, you had started working on this through the lens of environmental profit and loss nearly a decade ago now. It's amazing how time goes by. Can you share with us why you think it's important to measure impacts and dependencies and how that information has helped your business? Yes, sure. So indeed, um, um, we started even more than a decade ago, because we started in 2011. Um, at that time, for us, it was already crucial to have a natural capital accounting tool in order to be able to understand our entire footprint um, so that we can reduce it. And the idea behind it, I mean, as the saying goes, what you don't measure, you can't manage. And um, the idea, so this is the idea behind our environmental profit and loss account, the EPNL. If you think about it, uh, I think yeah, 15, 10 years ago, a business used to see nature as infinite and uh, taking resources limitless from it. But at Caring, we could see the, the limits and say, we, we said, okay, we have to be able to capture, the, capture it and include it in the business. So if you want to speak the language of business, you have to include these KPIs in the PNL, which is what we did. 
with the environmental profit and loss account. And uh, biodiversity was built in it from the beginning as we captured the complexity of land use change. And we had um, interesting learnings from it. Uh, first one being that our direct impact is only 10% of our overall impact, so 90% is within the supply chain. And out of it, two thirds are coming from the very beginning of the supply chain. So raw material um, production, so as I mentioned already, at the farm level, rangeland, forest, etc. So um, that's why we had to focus our effort there. We also learned that um, our entire land footprint, if you take into account the entire supply chains necess necessary for making all our products, is equal to 350,000 hectares, so which is about eight times <coughs> the size of Montreal. And analyzing all these impacts helped us, of course, understand our, where the hotspots are and enabled us to create and customize programs very early on and where to have to address the materiality materiality impacts and that's why for a long time we've been working with herders and farmers on the ground to help them um, transition to more regenerative agriculture practices that's not something you would expect from a fashion luxury companies but this is actually where our impact is the impact of our industry is and so this uh, groundwork we've been doing over years has uh, enabled to start the transformation of our supply chains to be more resilient more resilient to climate change and to biodiversity loss importantly also um, we have published the methodology of the epnl and every year we publish in great detail the results of uh, this uh, environmental profit and loss account because we do believe um, that uh, transparency is a necessity for business now disclosing impact and independences with nature is important um, and uh, also for us but for the whole industry as i said because we want to engage others to do the same thank you Thank you very much, uh, Geraldine. If I may just ask you a quick follow-up question with that. So it, from what you're saying with their environmental profit and loss studies, in other words, you've also developed a baseline and you're tracking progress in a sense over time. Are you, you're developing trends in your data so that you are able to assess yes. whether the impacts are going up and down, up or down and how you can adjust accordingly. Yes, exactly. So we, um, uh, we have set up um, an objective to reduce our environmental profit and loss by 40% by 2025, because this is basically a translation how of, for our business to work within planetary boundaries. And, um, and so the baseline um, is uh, 2015, and we have to reach this by 25. And I'm happy to share that we are already, we have already ach achieved minus 42%. Um, so four years in advance, um, but uh, we are now working on a new target. And actually, we can never say that uh, the work is uh, the work is finished. Um, we um, we have to continue to set the bar higher and higher. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'd now like to turn to Takao and. Um, highlight that the Kaidnernen Committee on Nature Conservation has been working with the private sector to strengthen action by businesses, <clears throat> be it through the Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity or by launching initiatives such as the Business for GBF project. Can you please share your thoughts on the role of business associations in supporting scaled action by business and mainstreaming of biodiversity as a whole? Thank you. Thank you very much for a wonderful question. So let me first briefly explain about the history with Global Partnership for Business and Biodiversity, and the, we call GPBB. And it started in COP10, COP10 Aichi, Japan, in 2010. And we hosted the very first annual meeting 
at the, our headquarters, Keidan and Kaiken Tokyo. And uh, we have been engaging this from the beginning and fully agreed with the purpose and so on. And uh, we think this is one of example to increase awareness among Japanese business. And the low, low business association. It's a little bit so different from study group, but the biodiversity issue is a little bit difficult to understand sometimes. And many abbreviation or jargons. And so what is ABS? Oh, it's not anti lac plague system and also CBD or so common but differentiated responsibility. Or it's not so, it's very difficult to understand. So then, so sometimes we share other so such information. And so awareness raising and showing the model thinking way or share best practices or providing learning opportunity and the or latest info or creating opportunity show the activities and the gain due evaluation also the providing business voice to the government or something. So let me provide some example. And uh, actually one of the main law of business association is awareness raising and uh, to provide the latest important information. And uh, actually information gathering need a cost, but we can share the cost. And uh, so then, so kind of economies of scale does work. And uh, in business and uh, a business for global diversity framework project, which we collaborated with Ministry of the Environment, Government of Japan. We share more than 50 best practices of Japanese companies and uh, which are mainstreaming business uh, di biodiversity issue through in main business and uh, so sharing that information through video and website and so on. And also there is something relating to technology and the products and services so we can learn from their examples. And uh, this is also a case to create or supportive opportunity for business. So which doing better actions and to be evaluated positively by the government and the investors. And uh, sometimes many companies doing best, so very good things, but uh, nobody knows. And uh, in that case, if government recognizes that kind of action, so the company so has gained some motivation. And uh, it is not so easy for companies to receive quick tangible benefit from biodiversity conservation. But so such as a government recognition and opportunity for better evaluation would be helpful to facilitate their action. And uh, also the showing model thinking way in one of our activities. We set so Kadian Land Declaration on Biodiversity Conservation, uh, which was set in 2009. And it's a statement about how business should take into account biodiversity issues, including responsibility of management, importance of global perspective, and also impact of global supply chain importance of integrated environmental corporate management. So tandem with climate change and circular economy, so biodiversity should be integrated. And also partnership with civil society or importance of environmental education and human resource development, etc. We also set an initiative which is formed by company who accepted such declaration. And right now more than 260 companies have agreed and posted their logos and activities on our website. You can check it. And uh, also we are supporting nature conserv conservation project by NGO through our fund. In the past 30 years, we have provided funding to more than 1,700 projects, which distributed globally and mainly in Asia. And uh, so through such a 1,700 project, we have learned what is going on in real conservation sites. And actually I had opportunity to visit Galapagos Island to see the real conservation activity there. And uh, there are many challenges actually. And uh, at last, 
but not least. So creating favorable business environment is quite important. And uh, as a so voice of business, and uh, we can so discuss with the Ministry of Environment how we can create favorable environment for business to do more. That kind of activity we're doing. Thanks. Thank you so much, and also for pointing out. I mean, from for example, from OECD perspective, it's always important to bring governments together to share lessons learned, etc. And you're highlighting how, of course, it's also important to do the same for business to enable lessons to be shared amongst them as well, and then using that as a platform also to cre create partnerships and engage in dialogue with government, etc. So thank you very much for pointing out um, the important role of that as well. I'd now like to uh, turn a question to Zhang. Um, can you please let us know how China is planning on working with the private sector moving forward so as to strengthen effective implementation by various economic sectors? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, as to this question, I, should, I, I want to share with you some statistics at first. Uh, in China, private sector contributes more than 50% of the tax revenue, 60% of GDP, 70% of technological innovation, 80% of urban employment, and 90% of the number of the enterprises. So from this series of number, we can see that private sector uh, is the main body of the utilization of biodiversity in China and is also a crucial stakeholder in biodiversity conservation. <clears throat> so, encouraging, supporting, and guiding the private sector to implement China's national strategy and action plan for biodiversity conservation is the key to implementing the post-2020 GBF and also the three objectives of the CBD. Achieving the transformational change advocated by the framework, uh, we could make efforts in the following aspects. Uh, firstly, strengthening policy regulation and, and guidance and mainstreaming biodiversity policies. Uh, two years ago, China adopted the civil code incorporating the green, green principles and providing legal safeguards for the relevant institutional arrangements. The Ministry of Ecology and Environment has actively advanced the reform of law-based disclosure of environmental information and issued the measures for the administration of the law-based disclosure of environmental information by enterprises in December 2021. It clarifies that enterprises shall be parties responsible for the law-based disclosure of environmental information. And this kind of disclosure has been incorporated into credit management of the enterprises. The State Council has introduced a policy to encourage and mobilize social capital to participate in national and local ecological protection and re restoration. The Chinese government will also update and revise the China National Biodiversity Conservation Strategy and Action Plan to further promote the mainstreaming process. Se secondly, <clears throat> building a multi-stakeholder cooperation platform in 2015, China joined the GPBB and during uh, International Bio a Diversity Day in May this year, we established the China Partnership for Business and Biodiversity, aiming to pro promote a new pattern of business engagement in biodiversity governance. At present, CBBP has more than uh, ha has about 50 members, with private enterprises making up the the absolute majority. The day before yesterday, CBBP organized a COP15 side event to foster ex exchanges with businesses 
from other parties with regard to how to facilitate the implementation of the framework. Uh, at the third aspect, giving full play to the role of industry associations and enterprises. For example, a member of the CBBP, the China Chamber of Commerce of Metals, Minerals, and Chemicals, Importers and Exporters, CCCMC, formulated and published the guidelines for social responsibility in outbound mining investments in 2019, played a leading role in driving the domestic extractive industry to, to fulfill its social responsibility for biodiversity conservation. Just a couple of days ago, another strategic member of the CBBP consulted with my colleagues on the feasibility of making implementation commitments following the adoption of the framework. Uh, to summarize, the final post-2020 framework must be one that gathers consensus among public and pu private stakeholders. And for China, its implementation is a process of exploring a biodiversity governance model featuring govern government guidance, corporate responsibility, and public participation. Okay, that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. And I'm just going to move on straight to the next question because we're running behind schedule and I don't want to try and um, enhance that. So, Andrea, can you, um, I'll pass a question to you. There's a strong call for a whole of government approach to ensure the mainstreaming of biodiversity across all levels of government. Can you tell us how the UK is addressing this um, at the national level? I mean, and how it relates to business in particular. Sure, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about three different things. The first thing, the um, legislative framework that the UK has in place. Se second thing, the set of UK financial sector reforms. Um, and then finally, talk about a 10 point plan for nature finance, which I hope everybody here has heard about. Okay. Um, so the first thing, just on the legislative framework, um, the UK has a Climate Change Act and um, at the end of last year also passed an Environment Act. And the Environment Act set out a new legislative framework in which we are going to have some legally binding targets um, on nature, air, waste, water as a minimum. And we're expecting those to be published imminently. Um, and alongside the new legally binding targets, there are a set of other measures um, outlined to really show how the government um, has taken our 25 year environment plan and really baked that into the core of our um, economy. Um, and we will be publishing by the end of January next year a new environmental improvement plan that um, will set out again the plans for the future. Um, I think the second thing then is just on the UK financial sector. Um, the UK government, um, for example, became the first country to commit to mandatory TCFD, so um, Task Force on Climate and Financial Disclosures. Um, and so that's fully mandatory across our economy. We then introduced new economy-wide reporting requirements in June um, 2021. We said that we would integrate the TCFD reporting with new cutting edge matrix, um, metrics, like impact reporting against the UK green taxonomy in new sustainability disclosure requirements that are going to apply across the entire economy. We then kick-started a green financing program. Um, in 2021, the UK issued two green gilts with a total transaction size of 16 billion. And the first transaction of 10 billion represented the largest debut transaction size for any sovereign um, at 10 billion with the largest ever order book for a sovereign green transaction. We've also um, fully started to embed climate change in the financial architecture. It's for the first time now in the remit of the UK's financial regulators, the FCA, the PRA, um, and also in remit letters for the Bank of England, which is resulting in real action. And we've also been continuing on um, thought leadership, in particular publishing Greening Finance, a roadmap to sustainable investment uh, last year. We then used the UK's um, G7 presidency to very much think about how we mainstream nature across all our work, including in the finance sector. Um, there was a um, outcome agreement on a 2030 nature agreement that was agreed across the G7 at that time. And um, the G7 agreed to also move towards mandatory climate risk reporting. 
And the G7 has continued to show interest in TNFD, which is the Task Force on Nature Financial Disclosure. So I think for us, what we will be doing is very much looking at the outcomes that are agreed here in the CBD and through the Global Biodiversity Framework to then think about how we layer on those additional biodiversity commitments to the very strong kind of um, architecture we already have in place. And then finally, I would just um, draw attention to the 10-point plan for um, nature finance that was launched at the UN General Assembly in September this year. So the UK, in collaboration with Ecuador, Gabon, and the Maldives, launched this 10-point plan on financing nature to really try and forge consensus on the key steps that need to be taken to bridge the $700 billion financing gap for nature. And the plan there is all about um, pressing for high ambition for public and private actors to close this biodiversity financing gap while recognizing that domestic resource mobilization is as important as international um, financial transfers. But what's very important is that that vision, and we'll be um, hosting an event on Thursday this week where we talk more um, with some very key international actors about this 10-point plan, is really about unlocking sources of finance um, from all places, in particular private investment um, and finance flows that really are aligned with a nature positive economy. And we think then we can really unlock trillions in investment for nature and biodiversity. So hopefully that's helpful setting out what we've been doing domestically as well as um, our activity at an, at an international level. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was indeed very clear and very comprehensive covering different elements of, of finance. So thank you very much for that. With um, that, we'll move to the third uh, round of questions. And because we are running a bit late, I will ask to be a little bit more succinct. Not too much, but not too little either. Um, so, Denise, my, the first question is for you. Um, the current draft of the post-2020 GBF includes a target calling on business um, to assess and disclose their impacts on biodiversity. Uh, we know that many of the impacts occur in the supply chain, <clears throat> um, but progress in addressing these has been relatively slow, I would say. From a company perspective, can you tell us how and to what extent uh, large companies influence and address impacts with its business partners? This calling is directly linked with the target, the, the target 15. And we advocate uh, via Business for Nature and many other organizations, not only in Brazil, but abroad, uh, that this target must be mandatory. So we need to adopt like attainable, actionable, measurable milestones for companies and financial institutions. It's so important to transform their businesses in practices. So it's fundamental to define mandatory for us requirements and not just voluntary ones. I think it's uh, we should have like numerical targets, targets focus on reducing negative impacts, and in the other way, expanding the positive ones. So considering uh, considering our operations and also especially the value chains when we have like most of our impactful actions and results. So uh, when we're asking about the impacts and dependencies, it's fundamental to work closely with like supply chain. One example that we did is like work since 2008, Natura, and especially one line, Natura Echoes received like two certifications from an organization called UEBT, the Union for ethical bio trade and it is like an organization that certifies communities in compliance with ethical bio trade so like use key, uh, of, uh, an ethical in fair trade approach includes the look, uh, the looking of uh, the impact of our activities into the bioma but uh, at the same time the verification aspects related to biodiversity conservation, organizational manage, management, good production and practices, and also address things that are terrible, like labor and health and safety issues in uh, normal occurrence, like of things that uh, child force, uh, enslave, child force, enslave uh, labor. And at least, Disclosing 
impacts and dependencies with transparency is also a way of influence our partners to society. So we consider that is one of the important things that we should have. We had a public commitment that we call Carely as commitment to life, which is for us a robust plan of how to address some of the most urgent uh, issues that we have in the society. And as a business, we should like include fighting against climate changing looking through the Amazon, looking to the biodiversity as a solution to address both crises, which are connected. One is the result of the another. So uh, a common perspective, a public strategy is our commitment, not only to have like a robust plan, but together with the other organizations, see ourselves as an example of how mandatory framework and disclosure um, could be an essential path for the businesses. So we are concerned that the overall ambition and sense of will uh, of urgency should be stronger. Uh, I'm not saying it will be easy, but we need to act. And inspired by other times in the society that we decide to go to move forward, and we were able to put in commitments, movements that we should go ahead, I'm like expecting to leave this COP, COP 15, having clear, measured and approved goals to how to reverse natural loss by 2030. Thank you very much for that. So also, if I understood correctly, a clear call for numerical targets as well. Excellent. Just to summarize. And transparency, exactly. Uh, yeah. So Catherine, on an Different question here. Um, many companies are working now towards setting targets framed under this nature positive. So we need to move towards nature positive. Some questions though abound on what this concept means um, because of a lack of a clearly agreed definition on like what does nature positive mean in practice? Um, and what does it really take for a company to actually be nature positive? Can you please share your perspective on this? Sure. <clears throat> um, nature positive. Um, we think that the the, the concept uh, in itself is very attractive, if I may, because it echoes uh, the carbon neutrality that we had for the for the climate target. But you are right. Without a proper framework, without a proper definition, companies will be really turned to to move. Currently, I would say that it's more of an emerging um, concept. There is no consensus to date on framework and definition, and we have several players on the ground. We have IUCN, WBCSD, IMEC, um, and there is a need for convergence. IMEC recently proposed eight early principles to frame the concept. What I recall from previous meeting with, with IUCN uh, is a, the proposal for, I would say, a shorthand definition, which is being nature positive. It's about having more nature tomorrow than today. And then it's how do you translate that? Are we talking only about biodiversity? Of course, it will be the, the main focus. But do we look as well at the, at the non-living part of it? And um, so some companies are working on it, you're right. Um, I would say a few are mostly, uh, mostly leaders actually willing to, to work on that. What I can share with you is the um, environmental roadmap that we have defined in Total Energies in several compartments. So the, the compartment that you would find in nature and, and the target that we have set to ourselves. All those compartments could be contribution to a nature positive. We have the air, we have the water, ocean, and of course biodiversity and, and soil as well. For the air, the main point is that um, having a, a carbon neutrality target is a must-have. We, we mentioned it, the link between the climate change and the biodiversity loss, right? Um, and, and this applies to us, uh, but not only actually to all, because it's, 
it's it's a bit the the effect of us all and and, and as well uh, to our supplier, right? With respect to water, uh, fresh water is to be considered as a strategic resources, and this is the reason why we took some commitment to reduce our fresh water withdrawal uh, in in the the water stress areas. This is in line with the SBTN. We've taken as well some, some, some action in order to make sure that the, the quality of the water we discharge to the environment is, is up to the highest standards. So it's about working on, on, on water as well. Ocean, ocean, concretely what we do is we leverage our position offshore. You know that we do have a lot of offshore position, a lot of offshore platform for nature. For instance, in Gabon, uh, we extended uh, the Gabonese Protected Marine Areas Network. And we work for our offshore wind farm on biodiversity net gain. Because renewable is key to decarbonize our economy. It, it, it's a must. But we need to be mindful as well of the impact on biodiversity. And this is the work we're currently doing. And it leads me to biodiversity. Um, we've defined uh, our ambition over four pillars. I will not enter into too many details with you, uh, but the spirit of it is that it's based on the mitigation hierarchy. It's about avoiding, reducing, and compensating. Avoiding, so we have some exclusion zone. Reducing, it's about the, the biodiversity action plan that we put in place. And this was actually taken from the public commitment we took with Act Furniture International. So to summarize, Thanks for the heads up. A nature positive energy sector is uh, targeting carbon neutrality as a must and an overall positive impact on, on biodiversity, water, soil and, and ocean. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I will now say that I would like the responses to be a little bit um, more concise, shorter, just so we have more chance to get the key insights and then move to the to the final question, which is also the one that's related to the post-2020. So, and I'll be quick here. So, um, the next question is to Geraldine. Um, there's discussion about the need to scale up resources and finance for biodiversity. Um, and that finance needs to increase from all sources. Um, I would like to hear your views on how business can be a part of that puzzle. Um, so are businesses ready to invest in the protection of biodiversity? In, in just one or two minutes, please. Yes. Um, yes, Katia, so the answer is yes, 100%. Businesses are ready to invest in biodiversity conservation, and not only conservation, by the way, but also restoration, which is highly needed. Um, and uh, we should not wait for regulation to give the full framework to take action. We can find innovative mechanisms to protect and restore nat nature. This is uh, what we've done at Caring. We have uh, a commitment to have a net positive impact on biodiversity by 2025. So there is no common definition, but our, our uh, view is that we committed to uh, re, uh, protect and regenerate an area that is six times of entire footprint. So uh, um, regenerate uh, a million hectares in our su supply chain landscape and protect an additional uh, million hectares of um, irreplaceable and critical uh, ecosystems. And so for that, we launched a very concrete action, which is uh, together with uh, uh, Conservation International, the NGO, the Regenerative Fund for Nature, where we invest in projects that do regenerate nature in uh, the supply chain landscape of key raw materials for luxury and fashion, that are wool, cashmere, etc. And so this fund is open to other uh, corporates. So uh, I really welcome you to join us to make a change um, by regenerating nature. Um, this is an example of science-led uh, science, science financing mechanism already operational and supporting nature. It's a really straightforward way for companies to give back to nature. So, you know, I'm very pragmatic, very operational. So I like this solution. Join us. I also want to build on what Catherine said um, 
uh, about Act for Nature, which is well, also for us a very uh, inspiring and operational tool that emerged in France, but now is getting international traction. So again, I encourage all the corporates present here to join us. Thank you very much, uh, Geraldine, for those very practical responses to the question and also the invitation that others can take part in that as well. Uh, my next question is to Takao. Um, in your view, how can a company ensure that its business strategies are reflecting the urgency to reduce biodiversity impacts and sustainably use natural resources <clears throat> in practice? And, well, again, in a very succinct manner, relatively speaking. Can you share three steps every business can take to integrate biodiversity in their business model? Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I think so first step with this was setting clear and appropriate global policy framework like GBF. And it's, it's very critical that whole world share the same vision and goals. And uh, it should be ambitious, but uh, from the business point of view at the same time, it should be reasonably pragmatic as business can feel achievable by some foreseeable concrete actions. And following the global framework, each member states must clarify the each national strategy and policy measures to contribute to global goals. And setting national target policy measures and creating guidelines for business by each government and it would be so necessary. And uh, for example, if developing countries are taking significant action to support setting up a so traceability system of raw materials and promoting so sustainable production procedure and so on, it would be very helpful. In Japan, a government so set up a council and uh, so to thinking about what kind of national strategy we should take and uh, so, so government is now developing as a guideline for business. And uh, as a Kedan then we are also promoting so action for 30 by 30 and uh, with Japanese government and uh, set the favorable so environment for business to support that action. And uh, in the development process of guideline for business, we also actively part participating and contributing to make it meaningful for many businesses and showing more their actions to take into account biodiversity. And that I think the second step should be the so favorable market creation. So sustainable products would be more expensive and need to have some significant early adapters who are willing to accept higher prices. So some governmental support and the financial incentive would be necessary. So since some asymmetric information problem would be a barrier for good market creation, so some governmental intervention is required. And the third step would be so the appropriate evaluation by investors, ESG investors, and or setting up an appropriate disclosure framework like TNFD. And uh, so we are one of com conveners of TNFD consultation group in Japan and making effort to make it meaningful. And uh, we think so flexible framework is quite important as biodiversity cons conservation activities are consider considerably so diverse and by sector and region. And uh, so, and uh, also we think the so positive evaluation by investor is quite essential. Thank you. Thank you so much, and also for the comprehensive response uh, covering different parts of business and private sector, etc. Uh, my next question now um, is to Zhang. Um, China has invested in different strategies for the protection of ecosystems over the last decade. Um, but with the growing population, there's also growing consumption of uh, goods and services, and hence also continuous pressure on our, on our biodiversity and its various ecosystems. Can you tell us, is the government working on a circular economy model moving forward? And if so, how can it be mainstreamed across a range of sectors? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, for this question, uh, as we all know, China has set the goals of carbon peaking and carbon neutrality, uh, which we call it double carbon. 
and initiated extensive and profound systemic changes in economy and society. Developing circular economy is an important way to achieve double carbon goals. This economy pattern is more sustainable and more resilient, and it will create more te technological innovations. Uh, the 14th five-year plan for the development of the circular economy released by the State Council of China uh, in 2021 set out pr work priorities in industry, social life, and ag agriculture, uh, but not only in these three areas, uh, it will also be mainstreamed in cross sectors. And uh, to be spe specific, the Chinese government has promoted the mainstreaming of circular economy in various sectors through economic instruments such as uh, taxation and green finance, including financial support for circular economy related projects, capacity building, government procurement of recycled resources and products, and increasing support of green credit, green bonds, green funds, and green insurance for circular economy related enterprises and projects. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> and now the final question in this round is to Andrea. Um, voluntary mechanisms such as certification, sustainability reporting, and target setting, normally adopted by the private sector, have been helping to, to change practices, but won't be enough to solve the, the global biodiversity crisis. Um, there is a general agreement that governments will need to create an enabling environment to scale up action on the ground. Can you share with us from your government perspective how this can be achieved? Thank you very much. Um, is that working? There we yes. go. Um, so four things, um, or three things I'll highlight. I think the first thing is the Task Force on Nature Finance Disclosure. Second thing is legislation on due diligence. And the third, I think, is supporting business-led initiatives. So just on TNFD, the Task Force on Nature Financial Disclosure, so we know that the mandatory reporting and disclosure of nature-related financial risk for businesses is a really important prerequisite to allow investors to make more informed and nature-aligned capital allocation decisions. And so we're really supportive of the progress of TNFD and are encouraging businesses to engage in piloting the iterative versions of the framework through the TNFD UK National Consultation Group. That platform has been set up as a very safe space for corporates, such as retailers, supermarkets, oil companies, and others, to really share what's working and what isn't, so that the framework really is designed with business and with the private sector. Um, and the UK government and regulators are then gonna welcome the opportunity to explore how TNFD can then be enshrined in our policy and legislation once the path to the I um, ISSB compatibility becomes clearer. Um, on collaboratively building the global baseline on reporting. So we're working very closely with ISC. So then the second thing is around due diligence. Some of you will have seen that the EU recently passed legislation on due diligence, which is how you basically um, make sure that you're not driving deforestation through supply chains. The UK and the Environment Act that I mentioned earlier has also committed to bring forward secondary legislation as soon as possible to tackle um, risk uh, within a certain number of commodities. So we're hoping uh, and working very hard on, on laying that as quickly as possible. And then the third thing is that the um, government has very much um, supported business through something called the Council for Sustainable Business initially, which was a, a group that was set up to advise our Secretary of State and the Environment Department. And that business grouping created a nature positive campaign um, and a nature handbook for business that was launched last year at COP26. And we'd very much encourage you to have a look at that. It's very sector specific. And I think it's the actual um, specificity in that that's most useful for different sectors. And then finally, um, we have a very strong focus on accountability and indicators. And we're very supportive of the science-based um, targets network, which we think gives companies and cities a really clear pathway to reducing emissions and tackling nature loss. Because um, we know that goals and targets alone aren't enough, and we know that um, parties need to be held accountable on their commitments. So we think an enhanced suite of accountability mechanisms really will improve um, 
outcomes and the commitments and actions of non-state actors and businesses will play a really important role um, in making the global biodiversity framework deliverable um, and impactful. Thank you so much for that. <clears throat> um, so now we can move to the third and final um, part of the panel, um, including on concluding remarks. Um, and here the same, the question is the same for all of you. Um, and the question is, so first, a lot is being said about how ambitious the post-2020 global biodiversity framework should be. Can you let us know um, what ambition looks like for you? So what does it mean? And how do you think policy can facilitate further ambition and implementation on the ground? So from the business um, speakers, so what would you call on um, from government to help you sort of continue to take action? And from the government perspective, um, yeah, what else would you like to see? And I'll take it in turn. So question is to you, Denise. Thank you. Um, being briefly and tough, I think uh, align the incentives, work collectively, um, having common standards as we are discussing here, public commitments, and as I mentioned, and I truly expect that we should act now. We should, I imagine, going forward of this COP with a quite a nice revolution, a quite a nice commitment in terms of 18, 15, 13, many of the, the commitments that we have here addressing by the COP that inspires us as a company to tackle these issues into the businesses, having a common framework, having a standards in order to address and moving forward. I truly expect that leaving this COP and going back probably in the next 10 years, celebrating that what we can do what we can do today and what we have done for tomorrow. So my commitments uh, are this and collective actions as TC TNFD, inspired by TCFD, actions like Business for Nature, ECG, many organizations. I, I love to see myself as not only the, the SDG 5, 13 or 14, but the 17. I think we need the goal 17 as part of their collective action in order to address and moving forward in the the velocity that we should. My concerns are that. I'm planning in the next 10 years celebrating here the efforts that we made that we made today. Thank you so much, Denise, and I also hope that we'll all be celebrating yeah. in the future. Uh, so the question now, the same question to Catherine. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to build on, on what you've said, Denise. You, you, you've said it already, some quantified targets will be key. I would add that I think that the GBF will be ambitious if, if the concept of nature positive is embedded. Mm -hmm. But by that, we mean that uh, it has to have a, a workable and scalable definition and framework so that we, we know what, what we're talking about. And this is... This is a work that, that has to be done by, by, by international, I would say, uh, institutions such as IUCN and in collaboration with other stakeholders like NGOs, like businesses. Because everybody can be and must be a contributor to that. I would add probably something about um, collaboration uh, because ambition is as well about, about collaboration uh, and about partnership. Uh, we, the private sector, and Total Energy included, we are no conservation specialists. So we need some partners to support us in the definition and in the implementation. And we know we have room for, for improvement, but we are transforming. That, that, that's really happening. But this, this call for collaboration, for me, it, it, it's key as well. So how can policymaker help? Well, uh, for one, the GBF will be key. I'm stating the obvious, uh, but apart from a few leaders who take some um, voluntary commitments, if you don't have a framework, uh, experience shows that um, nothing much happened. And I would look uh, for the, yeah. the incentives. <laughs> and thank you. Sorry. But we, I'm just trying to go through because we have 10 more minutes and four more speakers. So sure. I'll move on now to Takao, please. 
Uh, okay, thank you very much. And uh, I like, so the ambition should be so maybe say creating similar situation to what is happening for carbon neutrality or climate change. And uh, I like to see same degree of business actions and all businesses, including small and medium sized enterprise and globally, so take action. And uh, in the case of climate change, not only developed countries, but also developing countries are now submitting so nationally determined contribution. And some are so submitting long-term strategy toward 2050. So same kind of so countries commitment is so required. And actually so the in the COP27 in Egypt, we saw some division between developed and developing economies, but the, in the area of so biodiversity, we'd like to see the sort of one team, so global action towards so nature positive economy. That that could be the ambition. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. And I'll pass now to Geraldine. Yes. So uh, we hope that the global biodiversity framework will give us a clear north star and mission to which uh, businesses can uh, which businesses can grab on and say, okay, this is where I want to go, and then give the framework to be able to decline that for their own business. Um, we'll make mandatory disclosure about interdependencies with nature for businesses. And we'll uh, make clear a framework about stopping um, stopping biodiversity negative subsidies and turning them into biodiversity positive subsidies. Thank you so much for that very clear um, message. And now I'll pass the floor to Zhang for your comments. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in my opinion, the ambition of the framework lies in its ability to find effective mechanisms to safeguard the resource mobilization that has long plagued the effective implementation of the CBD. We all know that global biodiversity conservation has been suffering from a shortage of funding. There is a significant gap in funding requirements to ensure the achievement of the framework's objectives and the funding mechanisms need to be improved. So, if all parties could increase their ambition in global biodiversity resource mobilization, and especially if developed countries could further increase their international public funding to developing countries, the capacity of developing countries to implement the framework and the CBD would be fully assured, and other barriers to the implementation of the CBD would also be resolved. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And now over to Andrea for the final insights. Thank and you very we, much. We and might actually end up finishing early, but okay. <laughs> and um, we're very grateful to the Chinese presidency and for all their commitment to, to agreeing an ambitious global biodiversity framework here. Um, so I think from a, from a UK perspective, I think we, um, we think it's just very important that by 2030 we collectively agree that we want to halt and reverse biodiversity loss, that we protect 30% of the world's land and ocean, we halt species extinctions, and that we increase the mobilization of resources from all sources to fund the global effort to halt nature loss. As I said earlier, the 10-point plan for financing launched by the UK, Gabon, Maldives, and Ecuador, we think sets out the right financial blueprint to show how we close this 700 billion um, global biodiversity financing gap. We think we need um, specific and ambitious outcomes for the nature, but we also need to make sure that we have very clear mechanisms to hold countries to account for implementing the framework. So underpinning the framework, we need a very strong monitoring and accountability framework. And we also recognize that we need a constructive way forward on the issue of sharing the benefits that arise from the use of digital sequencing information on genetic resources. So we think the key to um, delivering all of this is collaboration, as others have said. We've been the co-chairs of the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People and lead the Global Ocean Alliance. Um, and we are very committed to working with all partners. And we really call on business to think about the, a call for action to really encourage all the governments here to really um, support um, an effective and ambitious global biodiversity framework and then an effective implementation um, and monitoring mechanism. So we'd encourage all of you to uh, make sure that your voices are heard. It's important we get this global framework um, because behind that we can then all align and start to halt and reverse biodiversity loss. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to provide a couple of remarks at the very end, and, and then I'll, I'll, I'll close the floor. So thanks so much for um, all of your insights and the practical examples you've provided in terms of why business is motivated um, to engage in biodiversity, um, the calls uh, on what types of instruments can be used, um, the bigger picture also looking beyond how public, uh, how the public sector can, can support business in this context. Um, and I, what I heard also from you is the need for um, partnerships, um, collective actions that were mentioned. In terms of types of policy instruments, I heard uh, mentioned to the need for also taxes and biodiversity offsets was an example that was mentioned by, um, by Zhang. Uh, as, as some examples. Um, I would like to, uh, and also different linkages made across the different targets in the proposed uh, post-2020 framework. And in this context, I heard mentioned to target 14, 15, um, 16, and 17. I will say I didn't hear that much um, explicitly about target 18. Um, and uh, that in addition, Eight, target 18, which in addition to re reforming harmful incentives, um, also has language there about positive incentives. And indeed, in order to internalize the negative externalities, the, we need those positive incentives. It's exactly those positive incentives that can do that. And I just want to go into this a little bit further because at the OECD, in fact, we track a number of these positive incentives. More than 120 countries are providing data to us on biodiversity relevant taxes, fees and charges, the positive subsidies, um, and also the biodiversity relevant tradable permits. And what we see is there was uptake maybe 20 years ago. So you see these trends going up, but they've sort of plateaued a bit. Um, and in order really to help transform uh, our, our pathways in more sustainable production and consumption, it's these types of instruments that can lead to transformative change as well. So in addition to reforming the harmful, we really need to scale up the positive. And I just wanted to make that point. Um, and uh, I think on, on that note, it will be very interesting to see how the rest of the business and biodiversity um, forum um, evolves and the discussions that are taking place, which will be also much more thematic, looking at different particular sectors and synergies, etc. But with that, I'd like to thank you all so much um, for all your insights and intervention and wish you um, good luck at the COP and uh, successful outcomes, obviously. Katya. And thank you, everyone. Um, thank you to all our amazing panelists. I'm going to take two minutes just to relate a story before we dash off to lunch, because I was reminded while we were having these discussions around the linkages between biodiversity and, and business and transformation and supply chains and luxury goods, what, what does that actually mean? What, is, what does that mean for biodiversity? And I was reminded about ostriches and why I hate and love them. Ostriches are incredibly scary, especially on foot. They are very big feathered dinosaurs. You don't actually want to encounter them on foot, but they're also incredible. I mean, they're, they're ostriches. And every, almost every single ostrich outside of the central Kalahari is actually considered feral because we nearly hunted ostriches into extinction for the luxury feather goods trade. And we only saved ostriches because we actually managed to then farm them. And we took all of the ostriches out of the wild, we put them into farms, and we, we managed to, to have supply chains around that. And then we released some of these ostriches back into the wild. And that is what it means to think about biodiversity and supply chains and commodities and sustainable consumption patterns. So with that, I would like to welcome you all to enjoy lunch. However, before you leave, please note that this afternoon, we're going to have two parallel sessions running. In this auditorium, we will have two sessions, which is on biodiversity, climate, and energy transition between 2.30 and 4, on greening value chains, which will run between 4.20 and 6 p.m. In room 230A, that's 230A, 
We'll host a session fun focusing on valuing nature and decision making at 2.30, followed by a session on integrated landscape approaches, an example of regenerative tourism at 4.20. So two sessions, uh, please note and please pick your room accordingly and thank you and we'll see you back at 2.30.